1996 into the familiar Italian house it is today. And whereas in the last 50 years, Newport Beach locals and visitors alike have graciously made the Spaghetti Bender their home and the Bender has been like family for countless employees. Chef Alfonso has been behind the stove for over 30 years with many other employees spending a decade or more serving guests. So now therefore I, Diane Brooks Dixon, Mayor of the City of Newport Beach, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby congratulate the Spaghetti Bender and Joyce Hoskinson, her family and employees for half a century of great food and service for Newport Beach residents and visitors. Congratulations. <laughs> Now, I know you're not prepared, but you're welcome to make any comment if you'd like, or your son, I assume. That it's okay with the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, the family. We just want to thank all of you. Thank you, Councilman Avery, so much for this uh, blessing for my mom, who, uh, what do you say, we're 100th of 1% uh, percent of people that last this long in this business. It's a major accomplishment, and we always thank the uh, city of Newport Beach for being so supportive of us. and. Uh, Boy, what a what a great honor and what a uh, fabulous achievement for my mom. Yeah, thank and you. And what a great much. surprise! We're proud, happy to be part of it. Let me do this. Let me do say sure. this. Sure. Yes. I I need to thank our staff. Honestly, we couldn't have been more fortunate than to have Chef Alfonso, Janie Barger, who is here, was my mainstay for 35 years, and uh, and also the people of Newport Beach who have loved us and we love them. And it's such a family affair, and and I'm just so blown away. I, I had no idea <laughs> why so, you were being called up there. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So I so appreciate you all, uh, all and right. the city. Thank we're going you. to, if you would join me over here at the flag, we're going to present the proclamation and take some photographs. Diane, could I say something? I'd like to, I'd like to say something. Sure. Um, one of my fondest memories is from 47 years ago when we started going there, bringing my Italian mother-in-law and listening to her conversation with your dad. Oh. They would just jabber away and it was just, it was so sweet and so dear and uh, we've appreciated you all these years and we thank you for your service to our community. Well, that was fun. <laughs> All right, now we will uh, dive into the Marine Avenue tree maintenance, and city staff will be discussing the current and past tree maintenance practices with regard to the city sap trees along Marine Avenue on Balboa Island, and the discussion will also review the current health and status of the trees, including a review of recent arborist evaluation reports. So just for members of the public, uh, the staff will be presenting uh, then the council will be commenting. And when we come to open uh, our public comment, uh, I might as well ask the question now, how many are here and intend to speak on this item when we get to public comments? Um, if there are more than 20, we'll, I intend to limit the public comments to two minutes from three minutes just to allow everyone to have an opportunity to speak so we'll gauge it with a number of people. So be prepared to, if you might be thinking of your comments, to condense them down to two minutes. All right. Madam Mayor, I, yes. I need to recuse myself. Oh, all right. You, out of you, an abundance of caution. We are going to miss you through <laughs> the next period of time. Okay, uh, Mr. Webb, would you like to begin, please? Yes, I would. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, and folks in the audience. Thank you very much for taking the time today to talk about this um, 
tree subject, which is uh, near and dear to our hearts. Um, I was going to take a minute before we start, because as you recall, the council asked us back in March to come back and talk about the maintenance and the trimming cycle and, and the status of the trees on Marine Avenue. But I think it's important because we have the folks of the audience here that may have seen various snapshots. I know there's been a lot of information out there, some of it not necessarily correct. I want to take a minute to kind of set the table about another project which is uh, related to this. So this has to do with the Marine Avenue rehabilitation project. And some history on this is back in about 2015, the island folks were getting together, members of various associations that started talking about maybe doing a potential rehabilitation project on Marine Avenue. Back then, former mayor, or I'm sorry, former council member Ed Selich uh, actually worked with the staff and put money in the capital improvement budget in 2016-17. We put $250,000 to start working on concept plans and possibly a project. From there, the uh, island set up a committee, a Marine Avenue Committee, and that was a pretty wide committee, I understand. I never sat on that, but I heard there was quite a few people on that. We had several people from the islands. The associations were on that. I think we had a couple former uh, elected officials, uh, two council members. I think even uh, the chamber was involved in that, but uh, uh, if we have more details on that, I'm going to have to talk to the folks who run that committee. From there, the, the city staff attended those meetings, and we also arranged for a design consultant to help provide uh, assistance to the committee in developing these, because I've heard things about the city's done RFPs, we've worked on a project, and we have. We've, we've got uh, a concept that was started on that program with the design consultant. Um, early on in this, too, the city staff advised the folks in Marine Avenue in this committee that, that the trees would probably be an issue in any kind of redevelopment project. Then uh, landscape manager Dan Serena was involved in this, and uh, along with Kevin Picard next to me. Uh, they have a long history with these trees and have been working with them for years and doing their best to maintain and keep these trees viable. But they do know there's concerns with the trees, and particularly if you're going to do a project, you're probably going to have root damage and other things. So that was brought to the attention of the folks as they started working on the concept. Um, as they went further into that, again, the objective was this to develop a concept plan and then go island-wide with this and gain a consensus of some sort of what the project might look like on this conceptual design. I'm sorry, did I skip ahead one? There you go. Yep. Mr. Muldoon has a question. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Uh, who was on this committee? Um, I, actually, I'm going to probably ask John Noyce to come up to you. Like, he actually was chair of the committee. He's the uh, chair of the Merchants Association and ran the committee. I didn't, never went to the meeting. Uh, Mark Bukovic at the time was attending on our behalf, and I think he could list all the folks who are, is on that committee. Um, but as a background, I was just kind of lining that up so we know what, uh, why we're talking today about me. Mr. Noyce is going to come forward. I, I want to answer that question. Is Mr. Noyce here? Would you mind uh, coming up? Mr. Muldoon would like to see if you could talk to who was on your committee. Good afternoon. I'm John Noyes. I'm the uh, president of the uh, BME, which is Balboa Island Marketing Incorporated. And I can tell you uh, who, who's on the committee. Uh, the names are somewhere in, in the package that I gave you. Okay. And do you want to know the names or do you want me to give you the like, like composition of the committee? Composition's fine. Mostly uh, we have... Um, we have citizens who, who play leadership roles in our community. We have business owners, city staff. We have uh, Newport Beach and Company that's part of our process. We had three ex-mayors, and I was the moderator of that committee. When did it form? Pardon me? We uh, formed the committee in uh, January of 17, and it's a subcommittee of our business association, which is a 501c corporation. Okay. And was there an official council action to create this committee, or was it just informally created? Informally created. By our staff in conjunction, was our staff leading it, or staff, did, you, yeah. did you lead it? Was our staff spearheading it, or would you say you were spearheading uh, it? Yeah. Staff was not no, leading no, the committee. Staff kind of, this well, was staff formed by the island. First. Did the staff come and ask us to form the committee? Yeah, the, and the, the way we formed it was with leadership on the island. We took people that were uh, presidents of the Improvement Association, of myself, uh, people from Little Island Association, and then we, we came up with a list of people that we knew that were... Uh, long-standing supporters of our community, long-standing volunteers, and uh, that's how we formed the committee. Okay, thank you. So as I understand, the committee had multiple meetings open to the public as they developed and worked towards this concept, and I understand they had two open houses on the island also to get the island folks and other folks involved in the concept development. Um, as that was taking place, 
A little later on, um, around January 2019, we received an independent mailer uh, that was distributed to the residents requesting basically a vote on Marine Avenue in regard to would we want that to be quaint and historical or classic com contemporary style. Um, from there, uh, a little while later after that, from the survey that was arose, uh, we met an organization that had just formed. It was the Balboa Island Preservation Association as they introduced it to us. And they were advocating to keep the island in a historical quaint um, mode, I guess based on their survey results from that. A little later on from that, in March of 2019, the, the committee and staff was advised that there's an independent arborist review of the trees on Marine Avenue and that a report was prepared by the uh, Babo Island Preservation Association again. So that was brought to our attention. And then further on down that line, as we started doing our annual maintenance, we had some discussions with the Babo Island Preservation uh, Association and their arborist, who was Mr. Applegate, getting some critique and criticism on the way the city was trimming its trees at the time um, because we do an annual inspection and a light trim just to keep them in a, in a safe mode. Our, our contractor, Great Scott, did that trimming on March 11th and 12th. So as we move further down the road, at this point, as I know, there's been no further discussion on the project itself taking place um, as we've been working through this tree concern. Um, there, there are some confusing things, though, and I point that out, and I want to make clear to the folks out there. There are two things here. There is a potential project being discussed that could affect the existing trees. That conversation is not concluded nor finalized. It hasn't been come to council. Uh, it's been on the island, and they are talking about what they should do on a potential project. There is another item that we're talking about tonight, and that's the maintenance of the trees. The city, the city has maintained these trees for as long as they've existed, and we continue to maintain these trees because they're a responsibility of the city. Um, and I point this out just as, a, and I put this in bold here, contrary, because I've heard several things. Folks have called me. I've heard statements and things put out there. The city is not intentionally over-maintaining or removing the existing eucalyptus strip trees to on Marine Avenue in any way to make room for the project. We're not connected to the project. We have to maintain the trees and they stand alone. Um, if the project goes forward, there might be impacts to the trees or there might not. But tonight we're gonna talk about the maintenance of those trees, how we have done them in the past, what their status is now, and moving forward. And I can point that out too, I put this on you for your information. The council had a study session back in February of 1219 where we did a complete overview of the city's tree programs. And you can view that and you'll see what we do on our maintenance. I think you'll find out of there, the city really cares for trees, maintains it, it does its best to keep its inventory of trees. We have over 35,000 trees out there. And you can read all about that if you go back to that council item. So tonight what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Deputy Director Micah Martin and our city arborist and landscape manager Kevin Picard to talk about the maintenance of the trees. Okay, uh, Mr. Muldoon has another question, please. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Just before we uh, switch gears here, who uh, ordered the conceptual design? Pardon? Who ordered the conceptual design that was online that so the conceptual design, as I mentioned, the, the committee formed and they asked staff to uh, be part of that. Mr. Selich put money in the budget that was approved by council, and that money was used to hire a consultant and to assist the committee. So we added to, um, I think they spent about $20,000 in developing some designs and drawings for the, now the committee and the island to work around and come up with a concept. Okay, thank you. All right, please proceed. Thank you. I'll turn over to you, Kevin. Uh, Mayor Dixon, Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill, Council Members, my name is Kevin Picar. I'm the Parks and Trees Superintendent and Acting City Arborist. A um, little background on Marine Avenue trees. The trees first appeared in the 1920s on the 200 block of Marine Avenue. Um, the eucalyptus, eucalyptus species pr pr predominantly was the flooded glum or the eucalyptus rudis. Um, today, there's 42 trees on Marine Avenue composed of five different types of eucalyptus. Um, the lemon scented gum is the predominant species. Um, it should be noted that these are not the, the same trees here that we had um, that, that are there. There's not any 100-year trees there. Um, that, that they're not the same trees that were back there in the 1920s. A um, little background on Marine Avenue trees. The eucalyptus. The, the eucalyptus trees on Marine Avenue were adopted as special neighborhood trees um, in November 28, 1988. Um, the trees appear to have, have been topped prior to the city's adoption of the International Society of Arboriculture Standards up through, the, um, up through the 1980s. And so we're not trying to hide away from um, past practices before there was adopted standards. Um, th those standards were adopted in the 1980s. Um, 
before kind of the science of aurora culture developed. Um, prior to 1993, city crews did not have the ca capacity to trim over 55 feet, so a lot of the trees were topped at 55 feet. In 1994, um, our first tree maintenance contractor, West Coast Arborist, uh, was uh, brought on and was attempted to, uh, attempted to do corrective structural pruning. Um, the city classifies um, in, in the G1 policy the different public trees into three categories. Basically, there are special trees, which um, are further categorized into the landmark, dedicated, and neighborhood trees. These are the eucalyptus trees on Marine Avenue are neighborhood trees. Um, and then there's problem trees, and then all other trees are defined as standard trees. Uh, it is the city's policy to retain uh, city trees categorized as special trees, or uh, again, in this case, neighborhood trees, that by their unusual size, number, species, location, uh, lend a special character to the residential, com commercial, or business area. Um, Special trees shall be retained unless there are overriding problems such as death, disease, or the creation of a hazardous situation which require the removal. So um, you'll see that some of the trees on Marine Avenue fall into um, at least two of those categorizations as death, there's a dead tree out there, and then the cre creation of a hazardous situation. Um, in the G1 policy, prior to the consideration of the removal of a special tree, uh, staff shall prepare a report that identifying and implementing specific treatment to retain the trees. If specific treatment is un unsuccessful or unpractical in retaining the tree, then staff shall um, report shall be made to the Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission. So what have we done to try to help these trees kind of put them uh, to to retain them. Uh, our past treatments have been minor root pruning and shaving to accommodate hardscape repairs. Deferred hardscape maintenance, basically we're allowing some uh, minor cracks or, or imperfections to the hardscape to persist. Uh, ramping with asphalt patches, repeated grinding of lift with, uh, lifting sidewalks, removal and resetting of hardscape curbs, cider, sidewalks and pavements. Um, we do annual inspections on these trees. We do um, annual trimming, um, for example, light trimming, for example, like removing uh, dead limbs, crossing branches, um, hitting the ends of the trees. Um, reviews by consulting arborists. Uh, we've had at least two reviews by our, our consulting arborist, um, Walt Warner, who's here tonight. Um, treatments of diseases and insects. In the past, we've uh, treated the trees uh, for lerp psyllid and tortoise beetle. Um, and supplemental I irrigation and nutrition using like a water truck. Um, it should be noted that the disease treatment, the lerp psyllid, um, what, we, what we did in the past is we injected the tree's trunk uh, with an insecticide because there's not much space to put, you know, we didn't want to do a foliar spray of the tree because, um, you know, there would be drift concerns. So you, um, it was noted on, I think, both <coughs> reports that there are uh, indications of, um, of those holes where we put the insecticide into the tree. So site conditions. In um, arborist language, uh, there's a very common term that's called right tree for the right place. So um, I, I, uh, I think many ar arborists would argue that the eucalyptus from the very uh, inception of them being placed there in the 1920s wasn't the right tree for the right place. A lot of people might, uh, you know, th people didn't know that back then in the 1920s based on our science today. Um, so the site conditions are very crowded pedestrian sidewalks, street parking underneath the trees on Marine Avenue is very busy business tourist area. Um, small tree wells surrounded by concrete in various states. It restricts the air and the water and the nutrients that can go to that, um, that root surface and, and get into the, uh, the, the root structures. Um, there's no supplemental irrigation. The only irrigation that the trees get are from the occasional water trucking that we do or the, maybe the power washing that is conducted on the, um, the sidewalks. Um, so during the drought 
time that we had in the 2013-2014, uh, the trees really suffered both from lack of irrigation and water, but also from um, the uh, you know, smog and ozone that happens during the drought. Um, shallow uh, available root growth area due to the high salt water table. There's been, um, during that project, there was some studies done. It's known that, the, that there's a very shallow, um, high, high salt water table out there on Marine Avenue. Um, and then there's been years of root crowns covered by decomposed granite. And then more recently, the artificial turf that was installed by the Balboa Island Improvement Association, which has consequently been removed. Um, and then finally, there's, there's canopies in close proximity to buildings, roofs, signage. We constantly get um, business owners wanting um, more trimming because th there's leaves and gut, uh, rain gutters and there's a, a, a big mess in their, in their um, businesses and the leaves uh, get into their businesses. And so we really have to um, withstand that pressure to not trim them so hard um, to uh, keep the, the health of those trees um, up. Uh, maintenance history. So for the past 25 years, the city has inspected and trimmed all the Marine Avenue trees annually. Uh, this occurs over multiple days in the early morning so as to minimize disruption to businesses. As um, Mr. Webb uh, mentioned, our last service was on March 11th and March 12th of 2019. Um, I want to note too is that we notified businesses uh, over, over a week in advance to this trimming. So. Um, the, the, the businesses and, and also some of the um, residents that live on Marine Avenue are notified well in advance of the work. Um, over the past 25 years also, the city has removed and replaced probably approximately 30% of the eucalyptus trees. Um, it's a, maybe a number of 20 to 25 trees. Um, like I said previously, none of the existing trees out there are original trees. Um, in May 2017, based on risk assessments review, um, and this went to the PBNR, um, they approved the removal of two special eucalyptus trees at 318 and 3226 Marine Avenue. Um, the city responds annually to large limb breakages, uh, typical during storm events, the Santa Ana winds. Um, there's also a phenomenon called uh, summer branch drop that um, occurs uh, with eucalyptus trees. Um, prior replacements were composed of lemon-scented gum gums, water gum trees, um, and more recently the African tulip and the ginkgo trees. Um, those were, um, the, the African tulip and the ginkgo trees were, were decided to be placed there as to, um, uh, during the, the, the talk about that project that was discussed. Um, cons considering the location, um, a lot of these older trees are reaching the end of their typical lifespan, which I w we, we mark as like a 50 to 60 years. Hey Kevin, I'm just going to interrupt for just a second. It was an important point there, too, how we trim our trees, because some of the urban myths I've been hearing about the city sneaking in at night and trying to do this, we purposely trim Marine Avenue early in the morning over multiple days just because there's so much tourist and parking traffic. We can get in there at 5 or 6, and we're done by 9, and we have to come back several times. We only have a small working window, so I need to make sure the audience understands that's why we're trimming early in the morning. It's, it's particularly difficult to get in there, as you know, during the day, lots of walking, lots of cars. Oh. One thing that I, hold on, I'm jumping really quick too, just to also reiterate, the African tulip tree and ginkgo tree, there's only one of each of those variety out there. And we planted those just to try them out, to see how they would do, how people liked them. It was never our intent to replace all the trees with those type of trees. Um, it was just a, a trial basis to, to try those different varieties out. So there's only one of each of those varieties there, just as a trial basis. Do those trees, uh, what is the average height do those trees reach? The African tulip will get to about 40, 40 feet tall. Um, the ginkgo, much, much taller, but, but more columnar, um, maybe like 60 feet on the, on the ginkgo. And then you mentioned that the, was it the business improvement, or the committee, the community committee specifically requested that the empty tree wells be replaced with these two trees? Did I hear that correctly? Or who decided on those trees? Um, 
And I was going to say, I, I remember talking to our former uh, landscape manager, Dan Serino. This was years ago those trees oh. were put in. It wasn't necessarily because there's oh. empty. There they were removals. There have been removals, as Kevin's pointed out, over the years. We've taken out several trees, and that was an option to put a couple in and try those. There are five empty tree wells still out there today that we're going to talk about. Those empty tree wells are done, are done because there was a death or design, dying tree taken out for maintenance purposes. We purposely didn't put one back in yet because we also knew there was a project discussion, so we wanted to see where that was going to go. But they weren't removed for the project. They were removed because they died, and then we just kept the tree well open. So just to kind of sum up where Kevin's been presenting the history. So over this period of time from the 1920s, so 100 years, the eucalyptus has been re replaced consistently until recently when the ginkgo and the tulip tree were installed. Yeah, the, the eucalyptus has been the consistent replacement up until recently. And then going back to an earlier comment, what was that original tree species in 1920? Were they the, all the, eucalyptus? The, 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 the flood, flooded gum or okay. the, the eucalyptus rudus. So they were eucalyptus? Yes. Okay, all right. Please proceed. One thing I'd like to mention on the pictures, that the top picture on this is the, the removal that was approved by PB&R um, at... Uh, <coughs> I believe that's three, yeah, that's 326 Marine. And then um, the, the bottom picture is the pruning that we conducted uh, most recently. Uh, Mr. Muldoon. Kevin, you got a great first name, but what is your last name? B. Carr. B. Carr? Yeah. Okay, Mr. B. Carr, <laughs> uh, the top tree you said is removed by PB&R, which stands for? Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission. And why was their approval required? Because um, it was deemed hazardous. They were de deemed hazardous. So normal procedures to have PB&R approve tree removals? Correct. On a special tree, the PB&R would, would require approval of the removal. Oh, thank you. Would you just explain, uh, Mr. Webb, that it's in council policy, uh, the role that PB&R plays, a special role that they play for special trees? PB&R has been given oversight by council of our, our trees, and most of the policies relate to going to them. So the G policy requires on a, a special tree that if there's a removal for the various reasons, it needs to go back to them. One of the examples we'll mention, we did we were just there in August because there's a dead tree on Marine Avenue. We took that to them, and they concurred that that needs to come out. So it's in the council policy. What does PB&R do when you recommend? Do they do a site visit and determine, or what's an educated guess, or how do they make that determination? So we submit to them a staff report that gives the detailed information on the um, status of the tree, the, the need for the removal or the reason why we're requesting the removal. And then we give them you know, any other additional information they may request. And then we give our recommendation as to how we should remove forward. But um, ultimately their, their vote decides how, how we decide to move forward with that removal. Um, to your recollection, has PBNR ever denied the request to remove a tree? Uh, typically, when staff suggest the removal of a tree because of, you know, disease, dead, dying, I have not seen, and I'm sure Kevin could, could attest, they, they typically support that decision. It could, at that point, it's based off liability and risk as to why we're making that decision, and they typically support that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Brenner. Um, I can specifically speak to in the late 1980s when I was chair of the Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission, and we made recommendations to the council. Oftentimes, we made recommendations to take trees out because we thought that they were hazardous, specifically on uh, poppy in Corona Del Mar, because they were ramped and we felt like they were dangerous with no street lights in town. But the council, bowing to public pressure, chose not to take the trees out. So the Park Speeches and Recreation Commission sometimes can make recommendations without as much concern about politics as the council does when they when something gets here. And so what happened was those trees were saved and subsequently we ended up having to take all the eucalyptus trees out just a few months ago and replace them with other trees and redo all the sidewalks and all the streets. But that's something that the PBNR Commission takes seriously and often will make site visits to see the trees, not maybe on buses together, but they will go out and visit the trees that are being considered. Okay, so it's a thoughtful process, a deliberative process. All right, please proceed, thank you. 
So this is an example of our uh, the recent fallen limbs, uh, October 2018. These are uh, happened in the last uh, year Santa Ana wind events, um, but the, you know we have fallen limbs uh, annually uh, out there during each winter in Santa Ana wind events. Uh, I think in the the bad storms of 2017, we had limbs go down on Marine Avenue as well. And I just go back to that slide, Kevin. I just want to put emphasis on this. This right here is why we go out and visit these trees every year. This is why we go out and do an annual maintenance on these trees to try to prevent these situations from these limbs dropping and breaking. This is always our concern at the forefront of our concern is the risk that's associated with, you know, tree failures and limb failures. So last thing we want is, you know, somebody to get injured or property damaged. So that's why we're really proactive in inspecting our trees on an annual basis and doing the annual maintenance on them the best that we can to, to try to mitigate these factors. And even one more thing to add, you'll, you'll notice in these pictures, there, there's, there's cars parked on the street. There was people walking around on, um, on the street. You know, people weren't hiding at their homes during these bad Santa Ana winds. So um, it very easily could have been a, a worse situation. Um, eucalyptus in others, uh, it, our eucalyptus are not dissimilar to other cities, uh, local cities here uh, in Southern California. This is on, um, in Laguna Beach on Broadway Street. Uh, again, a, a high pedestrian parking and vehicle traffic area. Um, it, they, they take a very similar conservative trimming approach. And when I mean conservative, I mean a, a thorough trimming. Um, this is another, uh, some more pictures on, um, in Laguna Beach on Broadway Street. If I could interject real quick, Kevin. I, I actually saw these as I drove around looking and thinking about our trees and, and had our arborists look at this. I, I want you to note the look of the trees because you're going to find they're very similar to what we do. And it's because these trees are in a similar location, a lot of pedestrians underneath, cars parked right under them. So when you're in those situations, other cities kind of supporting staff, because I've heard things from the audience that we are aggressively trying to trim our trees into non-existence. No, this is this is reality. These other people realize these trees are trees that tend to drop limbs and, and um, they need to be watched carefully and trimmed a little tighter, so. And then this is another um, city. This is in uh, Mission Viejo. This is uh, on Elisa Parkway, very narrow, uh, high-traveled median. Um, Again, uh, uh, the, the, the trees look very similar to our trees. And then now I'll get into the consulting arborist reports. There, there's been two reports done. Um, first, um, the, um, uh, the Arborgate consulting report. Uh, the author was Greg Applegate. Um, he's a consulting arborist. This was requested by Jody Boyle and the um, Balboa Island Preservation Association. Um, this report was designated as a, as a tree protection report. Um, I want to emphasize that it, it wasn't a tree risk analysis. Um, it was um, kind of a best management practice for the trees, uh, if you will. Um, summary comments on the current and future tree, tree maintenance. So again, you know, it, was, it talked about a lot of the, um, you know, the city's past mistakes in trimming um, and, and um, maybe some recommendations as far as what we should, how we should be trimming them. Uh, he was concerned about some lion's tailing, uh, structural pruning, and other pruning concerns. Um, I, I do want to note that some of the lion's tailing that that um, was suspected is sometimes that the, the eucalyptus tree does have a sparse, uh, in, it's, it's endemic in the species. It's a very sparse tree, so a lot of the growth is on the tips of the trees. So some of the lion's tailing, may, there might be uh, warrant, warranted as a complaint, but a lot of the lion's tailing out there was, I think, more of endemic with the species, not um, bad trimming. Um, also, the report was concerned about artificial turf and buried root crowns. Um, we're, in, we're in agreement with that. Um, recommendations on protection of trees during construction and repairs. Um, and he suggested no root pruning from th three to five times the di diameter of the tree. And I'm in, a, in complete agreement with that. It also um, kind of highlights um, what was said during those project discussions is you can't have a project without the tree's removal because a lot, you know, a lot of the uh, work on the hardscapes and the utilities was going to require 
uh, root pruning that was a lot closer to, than three to five times the diameter of the tree. Um, also, I, I, you know, even to repair the existing sidewalks without the project um, would require root pruning. So what we would need to do if we were to retain even the trees that we're suggesting to be retained is asphalt patching, concrete, um, concrete uh, patching, asphalt ramps, st um, stuff like that. Um, and then it, he also included a tree health and condition ma matrix. This, again, this is not a tree risk appraisal. Um, the recommendations included three eucalyptus tree removal. So while he was re recommending three, um, there are, you know, their consultant is still recommending some tree removals. Um, and then finally, he, he recommended a tr hazard analysis, again, by a tr tree risk professional versed in risk as analysis. This was not saying that these are high, high risk trees. There was no mention of that in these reports. Um, either low risk, high risk, moderate risk, no mention. So now we'll, I'll get into um, our consultant, consulting arborist report, Walt Warner consulting report. Uh, uh, the author. Just one moment, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Kevin, I'm, I want to make sure I'm understanding this. So, the, so this report went to the maintenance, not the risk. And when, when the trees were being trimmed in March this year, how many, wasn't it over a three or four day period they were trimmed? We, we were able to trim them over two days. Okay, two days. Was, the, was Mr. Applegate there on either of the days? That's correct. He was? Yes, both, and, both days. And he, was he able to talk with uh, the the city crew or the, the I guess I know we have an outside company doing it, but did he interact with our outside company? No, he he re, uh, he interacted with me and um, the the crew chief. And what did he say? I mean, uh, he he was concerned about um, some of the cuts that we were making. I think that um, I mean I think it was dark, but I mean I think that um, we were we were trying I. I, I think that we were pruning appropriately. I think that we, I think that we got agreement from him. And did he follow up with any further comments after the tree trimming, saying, "Hey, look, on a future basis, do this instead"? No. All right. Please proceed. So Walt Warner, um, consulting arborist. Uh, this was he was con uh, contracted by the city of Newport Beach. Uh, he conducted a, a tree risk assessment and provided recommendations. So um, the risk assessment procedure, um, when you're conducting a, a, a tree res risk assessment, it's a scientific-based quantitative approach. So, um, and if there are assumptions made in a tree risk assessment, it's made by experienced professionals um, and, uh, you know, with years of experience in arboriculture. Um, so whenever you do a risk assessment, there's a ti time frame applied. Uh, Mr. Warner's uh, time frame was three years. Uh, there's site factors that are assessed. So it's important to realize that, again, tree stability is separate from tree health. You know, you could have a perfectly healthy tree, but that doesn't mean it's, it's not dangerous. Um, also, there's crown considerations. You, you look at the crown, uh, you look at the roots, you look at potential uh, targets or objects that um, the, um, the different parts of the tree could strike. Um, and then you do a risk categoriz categorization. Um, so once you're doing the, the, the risk assessment, you, you basically come up with a likelihood of failure of a specific tree part, whether it's the, the uh, scaffolding limb, um, a dead branch in the tree, um, or the whole tree. Um, and then you compare that with the likelihood of that specific tree part hitting that object, whether it be a um, ca parked car, a building, a pedestrian. Um, and then you take those, um, the result of that analysis between those two matrices is compared with the consequences of failure. So most of the consequences, as you may su suspect, if, it, if in fact is going to happen on Marine Avenue, were rated as severe. Um, the overall risk ra rating in his report deemed high for 27 trees 
and moderate for 10 trees. And then there was trees that were rated low too. The, the consult, uh, the, our consulting recommends removal of all 27 trees with a high risk rating, and then a reassessment in one year of all the trees with a moderate risk. Excuse me, Mr. Muldoon has a question. Thank you. So uh, would you break this down? I'm a little confused. I thought it's 27 total or it's 10 now, 27 next year. So this is what our consultant recommends. And could you just break it down again? 27 high risk trees and 10 moderate trees. Um, he recommends removal of all 27 high risk trees. So 27 of the removal of 27 trees out of 42 total, correct? That's correct. So we're gonna move six, we're gonna get rid of 64 of our iconic trees, 64% of our iconic trees in the next how long? Year? Uh, he, yes, in the next year, 27 trees. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Webb, do you want to clarify that? Is that? Actually, and Kevin's about to get to that, um, because Kevin also did an assessment in, a, in addition to Mr. Warner, and he has a little different recommendation. We recognize that our arborist says there's 27 trees that need to be addressed now. Uh, Kevin, being a professional arborist himself, if you would get to that point where you could say your recommendation on that. Yeah. So this is an example of a tree risk assessment form. And then, uh, so I looked at our consulting arborist um, review of the 27 high risk trees. And um, I, I recommended based on a triage system and, ur and an urban forestry management principle, the removal of 10, 10 of the high risk trees this year. And then I identified, uh, it's based on the significant defects in the canopy and the root system in the trunk. Um, so I was looking at the 10 worst trees of the 27 high-risk trees, the trees that I feel that would fall completely over, not like a scaffolding branch uh, dropping, but more like the whole, a whole tree failure um, are what I categorized as the 10 highest-risk trees of the high-risk trees. Okay, as we, I have a question. As we go forward, would the outside consultant recommend 27 as severe meaning high risk, and you're recommending 10. Are we exposing the city to potential liability because we know that there are 27 severe at-risk trees that could cause potential damage, but we are only removing 10 of those? Maybe that's a city attorney type question. Well, I think that anytime you have a report that says there's a, a risk of failure that if something does happen, then um, that would be used against the city. Okay, and then just a follow-up question, just to this form that you have, uh, for the benefit of the community, if it sounds, it looks, it appears that this is a process, an analytical process uh, pr that professional tree uh, consultants or managers follow. Could you just explain this assessment form, just generally? Uh, so, so, so you so you rate the different parts of the tree. So, y if you have a tree with dead limbs. Uh, co-dominant uh, limbs, structural problems in the canopy, that, that might be one uh, uh, tree, tree part that you're factoring. Then what's the, um, then you rate that, the, the targets that that part could hit, and then you say what's the likelihood of that tree part hitting that target, and you might say it's uh, likely or somewhat likely, and then you, you compare that part with um, the consequences of what could happen if that part hit the the target. Okay, did you have a question, Mr. Rodman? Uh, Mr. Avery? So obviously different arborists will come up with different, based on just how they work. You, you came up with sort of a different view of it than our hired arborist, right? No, I, 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 I so when you're looking at a um, tr tree risk assessment, you're looking at um, the, the, so if, if the scaffolding branch or the dead limb is, is a high risk, um, is what you're analyzing, that high risk, um, what you're rating as high risk, um, the whole tree is high risk. So it's just um, the, the, the one part can, can, can categorize the tree as high risk. Um, 
And, and I, I agree with the, our, uh, our consulting arborist. I, I believe that there's 27 high-risk trees out there, but I was looking at the, 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 the 10 trees that would, would have a whole tree failure as opposed to maybe a dead branch falling. So you're making a sort of a judgment on the potential injury or damage. Yeah, I mean, this is my professional recommendation. Right. Okay. Kevin, just for clarity, I think we might have lost some folks. The difference between the Applegate report, which is a tree protection report, is more of a visual review because what you're showing here and what Applegate actually recommended us to do, this assessment, is a much more detailed, much more look at the structure and concern of the tree and takes in, as you said, beyond health, it takes in stability and other counts. And, and that's why you're seeing there is some difference of opinion. Applegate said, well, maybe three trees. This gentleman's now saying there's 27 you need to be concerned with. Our professional arborist went out and said, well, we should do 10 of them right now. And if you go to your next slide where you're recommending 10 All right, now. Well, hold on one, one second. Um, Mr. Muldoon, you have a question? Yes. Uh, the accompanying report that was provided by an outside individual, who, who provided that? Uh, Arbor, uh, Applegate, the Applegate report? No, the one that we requested. Uh, Walt Warner. And who is Walt Warner? Walt Warner is our um, uh, uh, consulting arborist. And who was his prior employer? Uh, Mr. Warner's in the audience if you'd like to take some questions. Um, you don't know who his prior employer was, Mr. Webb? He was, he, he was, uh, he was uh, the, the city arborist forester for the city of Santa Monica. And was he with, was he with Great Scott? No. He was? He was never worked for Great Scott? No, not no. to my knowledge. And, and who is Great Scott? Great Scott's our, uh, our ma tree maintenance uh, contractor. And what does Great, Great Scott charge per tree removed? Uh, it's based on the DBH of the tree, the, the diameter of the tree. It's I th about $30 per inch. Do you have an estimate what an average tree would cost to remove? Um, if we have a 30-inch tree out there, then it's maybe $900 per tree. And we recently approved a, a change order for Great Scott, correct? Um, the, the, the contract that, yes, we did. What was the increase amount? I think 200,000. That sounds right. 200,000. Okay. Um, Mr. Tony, Mayor Pro Tem. I was going to go a di different direction, but I'm not sure where that, I mean, that, that, that amendment had to do with the trees falling all over the city. Not even, I don't think it had anything to do with Bubble Island. So I'm, I mean, it, I, it was a fr uh, it, it was uh, because we wanted to uh, increase service and, and frequency of trimming. Right. Okay. Anyway. I mean, look, everyone's here wondering what you're going to be recommending and asking us to do, and this is a study session, so we're not making any votes up at the dais today. Um, so, let, I mean, let me cut to the chase. This is still going to go through the Park Speech and Rec Commission, right? So the conversation about when, whether we're going to be voting to remove any trees, there's no vote today at the council. We're at a study session. This is going through a Park Speech and Rec Committee, which is meeting, by the way, September 3rd at 6 p.m. If you'd like to go to that, i just letting you know right now, that's where nine of the trees are going to be discussed. So, I mean, we're, this is, I, the, the purpose of this originally, this, this whole meeting originally was to talk about the tree, tree trimming practices, and it's clearly morphed into something much bigger. But then when, when I asked for, I think I had asked for this study session. Um, I had asked for it because we had a lot of concerns and discussion about the about the the uh, the, the discussions in March. And you know, I, I appreciated our inclusion of Mr. Applegate at that time, and I was going to make a comment about that. So, to the extent that folks are wondering whether we're making a decision today, we're not. I. I I think that there's been some confusion on that, so I'm going to clarify that. The decision on whether nine of the ten are going to be removed are going, is going to be made by the Park Speech and Rec Commission on September 3rd at 6 p.m. So is that, I just want to make sure, everything I just said is correct. That, that's correct. That's where, um, in fact, some of the things I've heard from the public, I've heard that we're going to remove trees next week. We're going to remove them right away, and we said no, and actually in the report, and I talked to the press just recently, it has to go to the Park Tree and Rec Commission. They have to review the 10 trees that, actually one is dead, nine now, that uh, we're going to be looking to remove. Okay, because I mean, we received a demand letter today. I'm sorry, this is not public. I comment. just wanted to say that the community no. would like I, to I'm, have I'm due sorry. time. I'm sorry, we can't, okay. just hold your thought there. Okay, we'll have public comments momentarily. Thank you. So the, 
so I guess, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. I've seen pictures of a treeless Marine Avenue, and I, I'm at a loss for why that would. I mean, that's not that's not before us. It's not before parks. I mean, have you made any? Are you planning on making any recommendations that every tree on Marine Avenue will be either removed or cut down to the size of? You know, a sapling. I, I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand right now what what the recommendations are, so that I'm so that everyone gathered here is is on the same page as we are. Because I'm I'm at a loss for 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 this. And, and thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And that's kind of why I went to the earlier discussion because there's a confusion with the folks about a project and what we're talking about tonight, maintenance. And that picture that I've seen has to do with the concept that the committee was working towards without the conclusion of that committee making a, re a resolution. And there's an assumption that all the trees are going to come out. That discussion is part of a project discussion that has to continue. Again, there's a high probability the trees might be affected if we completely remove the roadway. But again, we haven't got to there yet. Tonight we're just talking about the maintenance and what's, what we're dealing with the current trees. Okay, and so a lot of people obviously would like to know what the timeline is also of the project since that's one of the things that's been discussed. And I mean, to my knowledge, that hasn't been addressed at all to city council. There's no timeline for even bringing any of the concepts to city council. There's not been any discussion with Park Speech and Rec, nor has there been any discussion with any other board commission or committee on the timeline of this. I mean, this is potentially and likely years down the road in terms of where we are in terms of trying to bring a discussion like this. So there is going to be years probably of public input on the on what we're even looking at in terms of a design or concept? You're probably correct, at least three to five years, I would guess. Once they get to a concept, that concept then goes through PB&R, it has to be approved by council. If it's a complete removal, there's all kinds of things involved with it. It's only budgeted now to just develop the concept, and, and that is basically going nowhere right now, as I understand, until okay. we resolve this. And then in terms of even moving forward from that, when we a concept doesn't even go into a design until the council actually approves a contract for an architect to do design, and that's not before us either, is it? That's correct. And it hasn't, and it it likely won't be for years, if I'm hearing correctly. Fair. Uh, until we get a design to bring to you a concept, it won't be going forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Muldoon. Thank you. Staff has articulated in no uncertain terms they have the ability to cut down these trees without anyone being able to stop them, and I'm trying to stop them, Mayor of Tom O'Neill. And this plant, this uh, s study session allows you, the residents, to say, we don't trust the city staff. And your gut is right on this. Do not trust staff on this issue. Staff is misleading you. The conceptual design that was put up obscurely without any vote from us on the specific design, then taken off the website, uh, meetings behind closed doors. It, what's going on, if, if we're going to cut down the trees, that's fine, but it has not been transparent. This is an opportunity for us to be transparent, and we can do two things. We can do a straw vote to tell staff put a moratorium on cutting down these uh, trees, or we can just tell staff, which we often do at the end of a study session, hey, thanks for your input. I heard all the facts. I want to greatly slow this down, and I want us to vote before any action is taken. That's what we should do here today, and you, the people of Newport Beach, have the right to that. Yeah. Oh, no. No. <laughs> please, then I ask everybody just do like this, please. Thank you. Uh, Miss, no clapping. That's right. Thank you, Dennis. Um, Ms. Brenner. I have disagreed with Kevin before on Museum House and other things, and I have never disagreed with him more than I do right now. I have a history of 30 years of service in this city, protecting trees. I have worked with this staff. What I see happening is what's happening in our country, where there is an eagerness to condemn and vilify and not work together and not understand that people make mistakes, that there generally is not a conspiracy. There often are mistakes made along the way where things have maybe not been conveyed properly to the public. What I see happening in this regard was that the trees got mixed up with the infrastructure project. The trees were not the focus of this. You started out talking about the, the street and the sidewalks are going to have to be replaced on Marine Avenue. You reached out to the community and you worked with the members who showed up. They can only work with the people that show up at those meetings. They worked with the people that showed up. In the process, some ar landscape architect or whatever kind of architect 
put up a plan that showed palm trees and the eucalyptus trees disappearing. Pictures like that show up all the time where some architect is being creative. That doesn't mean we're gonna do it. Nobody that I know has ever liked the idea of putting palm trees on Marine Avenue and getting rid of the eucalyptus trees. I talk, I've, I've worked with Jody since before I got elected, talking to her about this problem and this issue, and I've, I've worked with the Marine, uh, the Marine Avenue people that are working on the uh, infrastructure. I've worked with the, the leadership of the Balboa Island uh, Improvement Association. I'm just trying to get everybody together to talk about these things. Nobody is trying to pull anything over anyone's eyes. Our city staff works so hard and they do more with limited staff than I can even believe they do. And one of the things that has happened here is they started talking about infrastructure. It looked like the trees were being removed. People got upset about the trees. That wasn't even the focus. That needs to go back to the normal process of going through PBNR and those need to be taken care of in the normal way. It's not a conspiracy to get rid. I will be the first one to vote for keeping the eucalyptus trees. And, and one thing I want you to consider is that if you wait until those trees are all distressed, you can do what we've had done on Poppy, where we lost all of our eucalyptus trees because they weren't dealt with one tree at a time. When a tree needs to be taken down, and it is a danger, we need to get that tree down and get another eucalyptus eucalyptus tree planted so that it can be growing because that's how you keep the cycle growing of this beautiful tree street tree i don't always agree with staff they don't always do things exactly the right way and i and i said to dave you know after the meeting at the balboa island improvement association in march that where i happened to be there where everybody had their save the trees signs for the street trimming or the tree trimming to happen the following monday Dave never in a million years would have risked his career to plan that. that. That happened because it was scheduled ahead of time, Grace was new, other people were new. It was already scheduled. It's not, they didn't know what had gone on at that meeting on Saturday. Where Everybody wants to save as many of these trees as possible, but we need to all be working together. What has happened in our country is we are so divided and we are quick to condemn and we are quick to villainize and we are quick, quick to make somebody our enemy just because they have a difference of opinion. It's, they're not our enemies. They're working for us and we are working for the best for our city. And I think everyone on this council wants to protect those trees and wants to protect the streetscape that is there. But we need to work, we also need to protect the safety of our citizens. And it's not just falling branches, it's also the ramped sidewalks where we have an aging population. If we have um, sidewalks that are uneven and unsafe, we have to be careful about when our people are walking down the street as well. We take this seriously. Nobody is trying to pull anything over anyone's eyes in this group. And these people, I mean, I was not always a fan of these people on the council, you know, when I ran, but I have never seen such hardworking people. And now that I am inside, I know that they take their duties extremely seriously here. Nobody's trying to do anything against the will of the people. I've spent 30 years getting groups together to come down here to sit in those seats. And I have to tell you that when I've worked with groups like on the library, we came down and we spoke and we sent emails, but we tried to never be insulting. I've been so insulted by some of the emails that I've gotten. And it's like saying, you don't care about this city. You don't know anything about trees. I've been working on trees for 30 years. I've protected the palm trees on, on uh, Marguerite because the city staff went above and beyond when we had a fungus that threatened those entire trees. The city staff went above and beyond and found ways to keep from cutting as frequently and keep from infecting one tree to the other. 
these people care about trees. They love trees. It's not like us versus them and they're the evil villains that want to get rid of all the trees. They love our trees just as much as we do. Well, thank you, Ms. Brenner. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I mean, I, I'm not sure how to follow that. That, that was, um, thank you. The, um, my, going back to my point, the, I think it's, it's important to, that, that we're all on the same page and that's why we have study sessions oftentimes is so that we can talk things out before having to make decisions. And so um, I think a lot of you probably thought we were gonna make a decision today and that's just, that's just not how the study session works. So I look forward to, I, I, I really have appreciated um, listening and learning quite a bit about this and I look forward to hearing public comment on it too. Uh, I think if, if there's been a staff, uh, if, if someone on staff has made a um, you know, purposeful misrepresentation, then uh, that, that staff member ought to be reported. I mean, that's, that's totally inappropriate, so I, I don't know of it, but if, if the allegation up here is true, then it, that needs to be discussed. But you know, there's, there's a process, we're playing it out um, in terms of having a, you know, our council policies working through. We've got a commission that Council Member Brenner served on years ago, and we have some really fine upstanding residents who have volunteered to take that res role and responsibility. And I guess one of the things I would just say is, it's a good reminder that when uh, that, that meeting rolls around, uh, those folks are volunteers, they're your neighbors, and there are a whole bunch of folks who just are trying to give back to the community. So when, when we're talking about this, it'd be, uh, it's always good to, to be reminded of that. So I appreciate everybody's comments up here. It's been, it's, this, is, this is a genuinely interesting thing. I just wanted to make sure when I was talking about the thing mean conversation, this is an interesting conversation. And um, I wanted to make sure we were talking this process through because I, I admittedly, I think it's been lost. So I'll, have, I'll, sit, I'll, I'll give it back. Well, let me just comment. We're not done yet. <laughs> the staff well, still. Yeah, no, I, I said I'm looking forward to public comment. Yeah. Well, we don't, we're not even finished with the presentation yet. <laughs> so why don't we continue with your presentation and lead into uh, the recommendation. So uh, again, I'll just echo these thoughts that uh, we're all here today and I myself wanted to have the study session expressly to allow the community, the public to express themselves because there was a great deal of uh, misinformation and confusion in the community and when that happens we want to come together and listen to the facts and so that's what today we are doing and the Mayor Pro Tem is correct. Uh, we may be making some recommendations but there's no action or final action. This is just, we're early days in a long process here, but the, the maintenance of our city's trees is, as we discussed at the February study session, this is an ongoing process that's uh, led and managed by professional tree experts, and I don't think any of us up here are, is considered a tree expert. That's why we hire tree experts. And so why don't we let them proceed to conclude your presentation then, if you would, please. And on that note, I'll mention, Mayor, that so Kevin has recommended that 10 of the trees go forward to be removed now. One of them's already dead, the nine of the trees. And he's also saying we're going to be watching the other 17 trees and possibly removing those possibly over the next two or three years. Um, we have a detailed presentation on each tree we thought you might want to know about, or we could skip to the end to Mayor Tro Pro Tem and Neil's account. We, we aren't recommending an action. We just wanted to show you what the path forward is, if you so choose, or we could spend the time going through each Well, I, I think you should go to the next page. It's not numbered. The summary of recommendations. Would you do that? So go ahead, and Kevin, you got a table right there. You can speak to that. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, I do want to reiterate that um, the removals on, on Marine Avenue aren't, aren't new. I mean, we've removed and replaced all the trees on Marine Avenue over the last, you know, 100 years. So um, I think the only thing maybe unique in this case is that it's uh, a, a larger number. I, I know that this was proposed before, um, uh, back in like 2012, a uh, people had proposed removing these. And I think maybe staff bowed to p public pressure at that point and, um, you know, that's what I have to say about that. But <laughs> summary of recommendations, um, again, um, the Arborgate re report was a maintenance review. Um, it didn't include a risk assessment. It did include three tree removals. Um, our cons con uh, consulting arborist Walt Warner's report was a maintenance review as well. 
It included a risk assessment, and um, he recommended 20, 27 trees plus. The plus means that he wanted to reassess trees after the initial year to see if he recommended more removals. Um, my review was a maintenance uh, review. Um, I did a partial risk assessment, meaning that I risk assessed the 27 trees that he uh, concluded that were high risk. Um, I am proposing year one, 10 trees to be removed, and then in sub subsequent years, based on reassessment, another 17 or more. Uh, let me just clarify, the removal would be result in a replacement of what type of tree? Uh, eucalyptus, we would, we would be going back in with a eucalyptus tree. At what size? 24-inch uh, box. And what is the approximate height of that tree? Uh, it, it's, it's, there's some examples All later right. on. Okay. Why don't you get to the next? So this is an, uh, an exhibit of uh, where the removals would occur. They're red. Uh, the yellow would be the high-risk trees that need reevaluation. The green are moderate to low-risk trees. And the um, boxes are the empty spaces right now. Do you have any uh, city records that can explain the, the history of the maintenance of the trees? I mean, the periodic removal and replacement of the eucalyptus trees on Marine Avenue over the last 50 years, not 100 years, but maybe 30, 40, 50 years. Do we have any records to that effect? No. I, 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 our our um, inventory system goes back to, uh, to uh, I think, 1999 when West Coast Arborists uh, started with us. Um, and then there's not a lot of detail because we switch from West Coast Arborist to Great Scott. Okay. So, Kevin, I'm going to recommend for the sake of the time right now that we jump to the uh, proposed path forward so people know where we're going with this pr discussion. If you could flip to that slide. And we'll keep all the slides in it. If anybody wants to look at the various uh, tree slides and what we're recommending, why they'll be on available online for you. So I'd like to start with this one. These are the current vacant, vacant tree well locations. Um, these were we would be planting new 24-inch box eucalyptus trees. Um, so the proposed path forward regarding Marine Avenue, um, again, uh, currently there's a dead uh, tree at 315 Marine Avenue that we would uh, have we already advised um, Park Beaches and Recreation Commission that we need to remove that tree after Labor Day. Um, we will plan to go to PBNR as as already was mentioned to um, recommend the removal of nine <coughs> other high-risk trees, and we will um, wait for their uh, um, approval on that. Um, if, we got, if we get their concurrence, we'll schedule uh, those removals and replacements. Um, after the removals and replacements, if approved, we'll make any no necessary hardscape repairs around the uh, tree wells where the trees were removed, um, such as you know, uplifted concrete or broken curbs. Um, We'll also probably be um, ramping, like I said, the other trees that we're retaining with asphalt ramps or concrete patches. Um, in the, if approved, we'll be replanting uh, f the 15 tree wells with 24-inch box eucalyptus. Uh, again, the five current vacant sites and then the 10 removals. And then we'll arrange for the ongoing watering of the trees with a water truck, or we might um, be able to get merchant volunteers to help. Um, and then we'll continue with our annual inspections and trimming of, of the Marine Avenue trees. Excuse me, Mr. Avery. I guess there's no such thing as a no-risk eucalyptus tree, right? Well, they're all uh, risky. Th yeah, I mean, to th there's a there's a range, you know, from right. low to high. And if I'm going to be assessing the condition of the trees and make a report and give it to the city, you know, I'm going to be very uh, conservative. And I would err on the side of, of, you know, taking out more trees than not, just because of a CYA situation. Right. I, I, I would I would suspect that any arborist out there that would 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 have to write a tree risk assessment would be very conservative, if they have to put their name to the, to it, and and um, they might take on some sort of liability. Um, so on this next page, if you want to forward that, so this. Comparison to the uh, six foot. Yeah, the, the, these would be examples of what would, would go mm -hmm. back in to the um, to the fifteen uh, sites if approved. Uh, the eucalyptus trees are rapid growers. They the, uh, sixty percent of their growth is established within the ten, uh, first ten years. These these are pretty um, good examples. Um, you could see about 
eight to 10 foot tree, tall trees with a, um, a very narrow canopy? Um, let me go back just to ask a, a question where the consultant has recommended 27 and you're recommending 10 tree removals, correct? Uh, why? Are you, are you succumbing to any kind of political pressure because a room full of people don't want any trees to come down or uh, you're comfortable with that decision? I, I'm comfortable with that decision. I, I, th I, I believe that I, I'd like to do a progressive approach, uh, you know, a balanced approach. I, I, I feel <laughs> that the se 17 other trees um, can be reassessed. I, I, wouldn't be f I, would f I do feel strongly that within the next two to three years that, the, that most of those other 17 trees be removed too. And replaced. Yes. Uh, when you talk about ramp on the sidewalk or asphalt, is, uh, my understanding and visually in my mind's eye is that because the sidewalk is buckling, because we cannot do anything about the roots, that the roots are buckling, and so you put an asphalt ramp there uh, for, for people to walk on. Correct. So you have a smooth surface to walk on. It, it would have to be um, within ADA, uh, ADA guidelines. Um, you'd want it smooth. but. Um, Again, you're going to be putting that asphalt ramp on because I wouldn't recommend removing um, the, the existing concrete around the trees. I would think any work done, even removal of the existing concrete, could um, cause a tree failure. Okay, so you're trying to protect those roots. Yes. By, and hopefully we're protecting members of the public walking on those sidewalks by creating a smooth surface. Okay, so just you're now at the comments and questions page? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are there any questions of members of council? Uh, I was just going to say, if you want to talk more about the project again, I think John Noyes would probably be the best to discuss that because it's, a, it's another topic, but it does need to be addressed. I was going to get to the, uh, Mr. Noyes, but I just wanted to ask any other, Mr. Duffield, one other question. Thank you, Mayor. Real fast. Um, would, you think, would you say that the eucalyptus, eucalyptus tree grows two feet a year? I, I saw the 60% thing, but in terms of feet, you put in a 10-foot tree, in a year will it be 12 feet? In five years will it double in size? I mean, that kind of thing. Well, the first year I think it would need to get established, so it might be like one to two year that first year. But once the roots establish and, and um, that they're, they're getting into the, the native soil and out of kind of wh where they were in their box and adjusting to the site, then they might even grow faster than two, two maybe up to two to four feet. And then they slow down once they age. And then we've removed the synthetic turf because that was inhibiting proper water watering. Is that true? Right. That was trapping moisture around the, 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 the crown, the, the, the root crown of the tree. And, and that area is very critical in, in for trees, tree health. If you have trap in that moisture, it could cause fungus, decay around that very sensitive area. So maybe we, we inadvertently, we city, public, whatever, over the years, maybe contributed to some hazardous conditions with the tree, I mean, in terms of the tree health. Yeah, but I mean, some of that was, um, I mean, the, the DG cap and the artificial turf was, was necessary for um, making sure that there's no tripping hazards as well. So what do we, so now what have we done? Are they, ex is it exposed now? Gr yes, <laughs> it, 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 the artificial turf is gone, the, the crowns are exposed. Um, some, some are, there are some root collars, uh, that's the technical term, that are buried still out there, and that's not a good thing. But then you would, you would have a deeper tree well, and it, you would have more, uh, you know, a liability on your hands as far as trip and falls. Okay. Um, seeing no further questions here, Mr. Noyes, why don't you, uh, we'd like to hear from uh, your organization and your role and how you got here. <laughs> All good questions. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak because uh, what's really important to us is our relationship with the city council and as a business association and our relationship with the residents on the island. And we don't certainly want to be uh, look like we're the ones that are trying to uh, take out the trees. Uh, can I just interrupt you one moment, please? Ms. Mayor Pro Tem has a comment. Can, can I ask how long the presentation would be because I'm going to make it as quick as I can. I'm not going to take up your yeah, time. I, I realize it's late. Oh, yeah, the reason I, I mean, there are two reasons. One is we really, I mean, the goal of this really was to only talk about maintenance. So, so the, the project itself is so far down the path that I, I, I mean, and we have a bunch of people here to speak. So I just want to make sure when we're. I, I think the nexus is the fact that the project has somewhat, has been the catalyst for the tree issue. And, and 
So just talk briefly, if you would, about the project, because as Mr. Mayor Pro Tem says, we're here to talk about the trees, but just explain that nexus, if you would, please. To be clear, I don't believe that's, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think that's right. I, I think that the tree issue is the tree issue, and the project issue is it's a stolen separate thing. And that's, that's why I'm, I want to make sure I'm understanding this. I mean, the, we didn't do a risk assessment because we're having a discussion years down the road on a project. We're having a discussion about the project separately, and we had a risk assessment because we had someone ask for it. So, so I'm. I just want to make sure we're we're keeping focus here on this. And I, I I don't mean to interrupt you too much, Mr. Noyes, but I would really love to get to some of the public comments on this, on the you know the issue at hand. But go ahead. Well, well then, I'll please proceed quickly. Uh, part of the reason that I'm speaking too is that you know the business associations are the most impacted by the removal of the trees or the <coughs> continuation of the trees or the project. Uh, I mean, our purpose when we met with the city uh, was to team build with the staff and ourselves. We were also there to get an education, which we got over about 10, uh, 10 meetings with city staff. Uh, and we wanted to get the budget realistic. We realized that the trees were going to be an issue. We thought in the beginning that the trees were going to have to go and that we were going to have to replace them. So we were trying to bring together people that would realize that we had to get the budget up or we had to raise the money ourselves to get big trees in place. Uh, we began our meetings in February. Since then, we've had 12, uh, February 2017, excuse me. Uh, we've had 12 meetings, one field trip with city staff. I've, I've given you minutes and a sampling of those meetings. Uh, we've done an amazing amount of re uh, outreach on the tree issue. We've, we've had an open house. We had 150 people respond. You see the survey in there. There's like 42 or so cards that people actually filled out. Uh, but, you know, another problem is that like, a, like any small business district, you know, we are... We are owned by the city. We, we're not an independent business district. We are owned, you own our infrastructure. We are totally dependent on the things that you do for us and that affects our economy. So uh, it's very important that, that we get our message out. Uh, you know, in the, in the eventual plan, we have to put more things into it. I know now, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I'm talking about the, the project, but we need to have uh, other options on our plan. It's not just about the trees. It's about uh, having some transportation options, having some uh, Uber and those kind of things, places where when we redesign the street that these things are going to help us. And again, we're a, we're a city-owned uh, we're a city-owned project. We're actually we're a mixed-use project, but we're not treated like a mixed-use project. The, the city treats us like there's no relationship between each each lot. It's all you know, one thing, and and it, it is. Uh, uh, otherwise, too, I want you to know that we do have a lot of fun doing all these things. We'd like to keep a good relationship with you, keep a good relationship with the, uh, with the residents. And so it's really good. And we've had a lot of misinformation been put out uh, about us, about us personally. Uh, not good stuff. Not good stuff. So I'm going to quit because I know other people want to speak. And I just I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Noyes. All right, uh, now we'll go to public comment. And as I said earlier, uh, a couple things, just the pr process and procedure here. If you would like to speak, please line up in the center aisle one at a time. And uh, two minutes is your time period. And identify your name, and uh, we'll start. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Council, and thank you, Kevin Muldoon, for being a support of the preservation that Balboa Island residents would like. Uh, frankly, the plan to overhaul Marine Avenue started in 2017. The community was told that our trees were diseased and dangerous before any report was ever done. We believe, the community believes, that all objectivity of Marine Avenue trees from public works has gone out the window. The report that Walt Warner is simply a hit piece to get rid of the trees. It's not accurate. And we have our arborists here today. Unfortunately, we thought we were going to get equal time. Our arborists are here today to dispute what's in his report. In addition to additional independent assessments, the BIPA took samples of leaves and bark of our trees because the community was being told that they were diseased and dangerous. We took them to Waypoint Labs, and there's no pathogens and no disease in our trees whatsoever. The Public Works recommendation of pending removal was based on Warner's report in which the city states that our trees have heartwood decay. A lot of the report says possible, and then tree 220, Marine Avenue, has heartwood decay. Well, I'd like to show you what heartwood decay looks like. 
This is heartwood decay. This is what Walt Warner report said that our tree had. I'd like you to know that we had a to topiary sonographic done, which is very expensive and not very many people know how to do it. And that tree on 220 actually has zero heartwood decay. This is testing of the tree. Now this isn't assumptions or just uh, theory. This is actual hard science. And you'll hear from our arborists that this wasn't a rift tree assessment. It says nowhere on the report. Ma'am, if you can speak into the mic, assessment. otherwise the camera won't pick you up. Nowhere in the report says it's a tree risk assessment. The title is a tree evaluation. What we want from this meeting is that we would like the Marine Avenue Preservation Committee that was brought forth by Kevin Muldoon. What is, is that? Is that? that two minutes? <laughs> You have to, uh, I mean, we, we, you know, we've had f uh, an uh, hour and 15 mm -hmm. minutes. It just, this is why we are feeling this whole process is not transparent. Well, That's we've, how we're we've got a lineup of people speaking two minutes. I'll give you one more minute because you're the leader of the group. So if you could, I'll you would, please, okay. please, please, please let her proceed. Diane, can we, can we kind of talk about that? Because I do feel like she should she is the one that's brought their whole pres. She should be able to make her presentation. Well, I just said she could. Well, uh, for more, what what you need? How much time do you need? I would like to have well, actually, the same amount of time these fe people had. But well, <laughs> well, <laughs> please. I would like to have our people that we brought in, our professionals that we brought yes. in to give our, you're looking for the facts. Yes. If you really want the facts, you need to That's hear fine. from our people. That's okay. After you speak, if you could speak for what, how much time do you need? Three minutes? Give me three more minutes. Okay. And then your professionals could speak next. Yes. So. We'd like our arborists to speak first. Bob, you could let our arborists All right. speak. That's fine. Okay. On behalf of the BIPA and thousands of concerned Balboa Island residents, we request that the city council adopt an emergency and temporary resolution prohibiting the city, including public works and any public contractors, from taking any action with respect to the Marine Avenue eucalyptus trees, including removal until the CPBR Commission has held a public hearing and passed a resolution authorizing this action. The City Council can decide this matter constitutes an emergency situation because of the actual or threatened disruption of public facilities. Removing the subject trees would disrupt the public street and public sidewalk of Marine Avenue, both of which are public facilities. Two thirds of the present members of the city council can determine that there is a need for an immediate action and the need to take action which came to the attention of the local agencies subsequent to the agenda being posted. Here it was unknown until after the agenda was posted that Public Works intends to remove the subject trees next week, which is what Jeff Herdman has been telling our community, but he's recused, without obtaining required approval from the commission. Last part, to ensure the city complies with applicable laws, including the California Environmental Quality Act, the SISTI system must halt that threatened action until the commission authorization is obtained following a public hearing. Even Mr. Webb has publicly acknowledged in an article at the Orange um, County Register yesterday that removal of the trees would require the approval of the commission. However, it seems his department has other intentions. We need to ensure that, ha that what happens and given the lack of transparency with this process thus far, a city council emergency and temporary resolution is required. Thank you very much. And we'd like to hear from our arborists, please. All right, all right, uh, thank you. Let me just clarify, Mr. Webb, were the 10 trees, uh, the future of those 10 trees going to go as a recommendation from staff to the PBNR commission? Yes, they're, right now we're planning going to September. Okay, so, um, do we need a resolution to decide that? That's already on track to do that. I don't that. think you need a resolution. There's a normal process through your policy to go through that. That was one of the rumors I've heard that we're going to work, come in next week and take the trees out. That is not true. And that's not true. That is not something we're planning. All right, so it will be a public hearing. Do you know the date? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, you said it was September 10th? 3rd. September 3rd, the Public Beaches and Recreation, Parks, Beaches and Recreation Commission will be meeting, and the recommendation for these 10 trees will be as an agenda item at that meeting. Yes, there's nine trees actually because yes, one's, one, one's already dead. Okay, 
Uh, are you one of the professionals? Yes, I am. Oh, please, please identify yourself, please. Honorable Mayor and City Council members, I'm Mark Porter. I'm a consulting arborist. The Balboa Island Preservation Association hired me to provide an independent evaluation of Walt Warnier's report. And right from the beginning in the introduction of Warnier's report, um, I had a, a little bit of concern because it went right into problems with the trees. Um, so there's no mention of any value, benefit, or utility of the trees on Marine Avenue, which according to residents, sets the stage right away for removal. And I think that's true. Both Warnier's report and the city uh, summary of Warnier's report do not provide any opportunity for balance, just one mitigation option, option and that's removal. Tree risk mitigation should consider alternative risk reduction strategies. Nothing's mentioned. It's not talked about at all. Those, those should not be disproportionate to the value benefit or utility the trees provide. But if we fail to mention value or benefit, there's no balance. Nothing. It's one, one way. Most trees on Marine Avenue are lemon scented gum, which are very, very successful street trees by many cities. It's one of the most well behaved species of all the ukes. There's about 300 introduced in California, there's about 100 left that work, and that's one of the ones that work. I have very important tree failure statistics that were not mentioned in any of the reports from the California Tree Failure Report Program that started in 1987. I've been to almost every meeting since it started. In Half Moon Bay, California, I helped get it in Fullerton. We have two meetings a year. I haven't seen anybody here. Walt Warner's report uses words like maybe, possibly, likely. There are no mention of a level three advanced risk assessment in neither Walt's or the staff's. A level three is advanced testing, like what Jody showed with sonic tomography. In the reports, there's no mention of drilling or resistance testing, no sonic tomography, no root crown excavation to assess root decay, no ground penetrating radar to map tree roots, no proof of heartwood decay, and no lab reports, no recorded measure of lean, and no mention of self correction. The report calls asymmetrical a defect. Eucalyptus by nature, asymmetrical. Look in the, in, on the internet of the eucalyptus trees in, in their native uh, land in Australia. They're, they're not perfect, symmetrical like a pine tree in the forest. In addition, there's no pool tests and no suggested use of inclinometer or recordable tilt sensors to check temp tilt over potential. These stats are very, very important to managing risk. And they said after, since 1987, there's 6,000 tree failure reports. The, all the, the lemon scented ukes that failed in, of all the reports generated, 6,000 reports, there's only 21. 21 generated failure reports. And of root failures, having the whole tree fall over, there's only three. That's not very many. Did you want to conclude? Oh, could I sure. finish, please? Um, should testing have, in, 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 the report condemns the trees without testing. Think of putting a loved one on hospice without an x-ray lab test, an MRI, or without proper clinical diagnosis. Should testing have taken place to justify this severe of a recommendation? The answer is clear, yes, should have been done. It's my professional opinion that Baboa Island Preservation Association concerns are not only legitimate, their concerns are both valid and sound. Thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. Please, no, 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 please don't comment. Okay, uh, the next professional who, consultant who's here, would you please come forward and identify yourself? My name is Greg Applegate. Um, you have my report. I was the uh, first and for a while the only uh, certified tree risk assessor in the state. Uh, if I had known that this was going to be a tree risk assessment, I would have done one. It wouldn't agree uh, very much at all with uh, the one you have. But uh, anyway, I was an expert witness on uh, the tree that fell on uh, Irvine Avenue. Uh, you probably remember that case. Uh, that tree was a blue gum, not a lemon gum. It fell because there were no roots on the uh, side of the left turn lane that was built a few years before. They cut the roots on one side less than a foot from the trunk. Uh, hardly the tree's fault. I got to see that stump. Uh, it was 
after it was pulled out of the ground. Uh, there's no true statistics for tree failures, uh, except what's reported to by, by volunteers to the California Tree Failure Report Program that Mark mentioned. Uh, blue gums have a bad reputation, but they're uh, found all up and down the state, they're very common. Uh, they're often the biggest and oldest trees left over from agricultural uh, windrows and preserved without sufficient uh, clearance for the roots. Uh, there's no blue gums, fortunately, on Marine Way, though. The um, uh, uh, many eucalyptus trees, including the uh, lemon gum trees on Marine Avenue, are very good to street trees. Uh, due to their growth habit. They don't drop messy fruit. They're very decay resistant. They let some sun through. And for their size, uh, the roots are very fine and don't do much paving damage as many other trees uh, of similar size would. I didn't find any uh, root decay where it was mentioned in the city, uh, city's arborist report. Uh, there was one time I thought I saw what he was talking about. I probed it, and it turned out it was just a few layers of bark that accumulated at uh, the soil line. Uh, marine avenue trees are uh, well suited to this environment. They've caused very little uh, damage, especially considering the uh, small space that they're growing in. I think they have uh, many good years left if the uh, risk that's mentioned uh, is uh, mitigated. And again, I only thought th uh, three trees needed to be removed. One was dead, and one's that uh, great big one in front of Starbucks. Anyway, I hope the city will uh, stop the uh, lion tailing and stuff that's been going on. But a lot of tree services, that seems to be the only thing they, they know. Any kind of uh, retrenchment and bringing the trees in, uh, that would really help. Uh, lion tailing that's been done actually increases. Uh, the limb drop and, and limb failure. So if you have any questions, uh, let me know. Well, thank you so much, sir. Any other professional comments? Are there any other professional tree mem Are you a consultant? Not an arborist, but I am counsel to the BIPA. So I would consider myself a professional. Okay. All right. What's your name, please? Thank you, Ms. Dixon. My name is Jim Maloney. I'm a partner with Gibson Dunn. I was first brought in uh, when Jody started her campaign to look into what the city was doing. At first, I was skeptical, like many of you, that something would be uh, out of place. Um, I, in the past six months, have served public records requests on the city. I've gotten hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of documents from the city. I accompanied Jody and her members to meet with city staff, in particular Dave Webb, Micah, and Grace. And we spoke with them about the residents' concerns about the trees. And I guess we brought up the fact that the city has a tree policy. We asked them about the tree policy. How come they're not complying with it? They didn't have an answer. They said there's some development coming. All the trees are going to have to come out. So why put eucalyptus back in these planter boxes when they're going to come back out a year or two later? That was my first concern. We were in that meeting for three hours. And where I really got concerned is when we were conveying the importance of the trees to the residents. And Mr. Webb, I'm sorry, but you'll remember what you said. You said to us, when all those trees are gone, six months later, no one's going to remember them. And that, at that moment, I knew the staff for the city here was biased. That no matter what we said, no matter what we brought up, their, they, their decision was made. And I would point out, this was before they hired Walt Warner. This is before they got the expert reports to contradict Jody and the BIPA's specific reports. This was very troubling to me, which is why we've continued with the public records reports, and we've continued to try to create transparency to the, to the residents to know what's going on. Because to go after the trees in the manner, I understand public safety, and you made that your point. But then when we looked at the reports and we found out that the city wasn't not only following its policy, but as the other two arborists said, weren't conducting the requisite tests, then it just, things didn't add up. And so I would just, I, I, you know, Ms. Brenner, you've ridden in my Mustang in the, in the Balboa Parade, and I, I, I honestly, I sincerely believe you want to do what's best. And I'm not suggesting that we have people get hit by limbs, 
But when the, the BIPA tried to stop the trimming in March and the city proceeded anyway, and then t two months later, the city's own arborist, Walt Warner, comes up with a report that says the trees have over, been over trimmed and, and, and they've been lion's tailed and the LCR, the live crown ratio is too low. Now we have to take it out. It really makes me wonder what was the rush to trim the trees? The BIPA has simply been asking for a moratorium to slow down the tree trimming we understand these trees are supposed to be trimmed once every five years. And when we see these pictures of a tree limb that fell in October of 2018, it makes me wonder, was that because of the tree trimmer that the city used? Because they lion's tailed the tree? Is that why the branch came down? I don't think because we see a branch lying on the sidewalk, that necessarily means the trees are a hazard to public safety. I think it means we need to take a look at who's trimming the trees, why are they trimming the trees, how often are they trimming the trees, and where is all this going? And I'll leave the time for questions or anyone else, but I just had to, I had a nice, disciplined, clean thing here, but after hearing what I heard, I had to get to the point. Okay, thank you very much. And is there another tree professional or representative of BIPA? Thank you. Thank you. Shh, shh. Hey, Everybody's going to be spoken. Please, please refrain from speaking. But if we are now in literal public comment, we'll go to the two-minute period. Yeah, he's a professional. You're one more professional. I'm a professional. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Professionals, speak. I want to say uh, my name is Casper Yen. Uh, thank you to the City Council for having us here. Uh, opportunity to speak to you guys and to the audience members for coming. Uh, I wanted to talk about the city's tree policy. Um, it appears that the city hasn't been following it, and I will go ahead and excerpt from the tree policy here so that the audience is aware. Uh, the eucalyptus trees are designated as special neighborhood trees, and as such, give a certain character to the neighborhood, which I think we can all agree that the eucalyptus trees on Marina Avenue does do. Uh, for instance, earlier today, the city staff members talked about the installation of astroturf around the trees, which I think we can all agree is not beneficial to the health of the tree, uh, and yet, and I believe they have been recently removed, but why has that been in place for the last 10 years? Uh, the over-trimming the tree, which Mr. Maloney just mentioned, um, that, as evidenced by the city's own arborist report, uh, the trees have been over-trimmed, and yet the city is having trees trimmed in that method. Um, the, the number of times the trees have been trimmed as well is of concern. Um, trees have been trimmed on a pretty regular basis, not every five years or every two years that the contractors have been doing. Uh, the recent removal of the trees in 2017 is also considering because during this, uh, the city staff here represented to us that the trees that are being removed will then be replaced with like kind trees, which is exactly what the policy states, which are trees are replaced one for one with like kind trees. Um, yet, in part of our Public Records Act request, we have received emails and we have read emails where the city staff has essentially said that the eucalyptus trees are not suitable for the coast and those are not the type of trees that they are looking for to be replaced in this area. And I think that kind of goes to the transparency argument that we're trying to make, which is the city tells us one thing, yet does another. Uh, and that is very concerning to the community um, as a whole. And I think I'll leave it at that. All right, thank you very much. All right, now we'll go to regular, oh, excuse me. Are you another? I'm the I'm Walt Warner. The All right, Mr. Warner, why don't you speak? <laughs> You've been men your name has been mentioned. Go no right ahead. No when you hear my name. And Mark, if you I've known you for 25 years. It's pronounced Warner, not Warnier. Okay, so I just want to correct that. Uh, okay. okay? Um, just some brief background on my history. I've been in the business since 1975. I focused on urban forestry since about 1986. The 27 trees that I recommended for removal should absolutely be removed. They pose an aggregate risk. One tree by itself poses a risk to people, but when you have 27 trees posing a risk to multiple locations in a concentrated area, I think it poses a higher level of risk. Yes, Mark is correct in saying that third level testing is an option. However, you have to weigh out the benefits and the costs. Those third level testings, they're fun to do, but they're expensive for the city to do, and it's expensive to conduct, and it costs a lot of money. When you look at the value of the tree, the, act the actual appraised value of the tree compared to the amount of money you would spend trying to save the tree, 
you weigh those costs out. And I felt that the cost to retain those trees or do the third level testing would exceed the value of the trees. The trees that we see today are just a snapshot in time. They're not the same 100-year-old trees that, we've, that, that the rumor goes around that people are under the assumption that we've got ancient trees or special trees on Marine Avenue. They're special in the sense that they provide ambiance to Marine Avenue. They're very attractive. They do a lot for the shade, but they provide a lot of risk as well. They've most likely be, been replaced in the past for the same reasons that they're recommended for removal now. They've, they've done hardscape damage, they've probably dropped branches, they probably posed a risk, and urban forestry not being as advanced then as it is today, the way they dealt with it was remove and replace. That was the standard process. There's a past history of failures of eucalyptus trees not just the eucalyptus citriodora or the corymbia citriodora now, uh, their eucalyptus trees as a whole are a high risk, uh, are a high risk species. I've had tens of thousands of eucalyptus trees under my care. I've dissected thousands of eucalyptus trees. What you see above ground with those eucalyptus trees is probably 50 times greater in what's underground holding that tree in, the, in ground. There's not a lot of root mass to those trees. That's why those trees are not causing a lot of hardscape damage. There's not a lot of roots there. So when you do start cutting roots, you increase the potential risk. When you have a asymmetrical crown with a leaning tree and not a large root mass holding the tree in place, you have a risky tree. So I will leave it at that, but when I said suspected hardwood, that's because I did not do any invasive testing. But the, the history that, that, that surrounds the tree leads to, a, in my history, in my experience, there was decay, and it, that's the tree's natural defense mechanism, is to produce new wood around the decay. So a lot of times you might find a healthy sounding eucalyptus tree, but inside there is going to be decay. decay. That's why I say suspected, I did not say confirmed uh, de decay, heartwood decay. So I'll leave those comments at that, but uh, my recommendation, I stand behind my recommendation. I am not a hit man, I'm an arborist and I'm an urban forester. I'll be the first one to stand up and say, this tree should absolutely remain. But I'll also be the first person to say, this tree needs to be removed because it poses a risk that's unnecessary. And I would think with the history of tree failures in this city, then the, the city council would take this more into consideration. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. All right, now we'll go to public comments for at the two minute. I'm not a professional, <laughs> but I'm a 30 year resident. Bob okay. Rush, you all know me. Uh, I totally agree with Ms. Brenner. I think we all should work together. The problem is it requires good faith on all parties. And when we don't have good faith or we act in an unethical or, or, or uh, corrupt manner, it, it weakens the process, it creates doubt, and it causes problems, which is what's happened here. Um, I draw your attention to an exhibit that I distributed to you guys. In August of 2017, the FPPC was contacted and re responded with a reply of whether or not Councilman Herdman had a conflict with respect to Marina Avenue project. They came back and he said, absolutely, he has an ethical conflict and he cannot work on the project at all. But since this letter came out, I've discovered as much as two dozen violations and what I would call egregious violations. So he's directing staff, he's directing city uh, manager, he's directing uh, Department of Utilities people, he's embedded himself so uh, intensely into the process, the Marina Avenue renovation process, as well as the trees, that you can't distinguish his actions from that of operations. So I'm alerting to you, I'm alerting you to this fact that one, this is happening and it's destroying the process, in my opinion. It's one of the main reasons it's destroying. He actually directed staff to hide information from, this, from the city, from the public. Now, that, that goes to the heart of the issue, the, the distrust. Um, 
I'm going to be submitting this to the FPPC, and it's going to be a severe problem for Mr. Herdman because he's already been warned about them, about his conflict. He's already been warned about previous ethical violations. And I would respectfully request you folks to either censure him or remove him from this stuff or remove him from the bench or the dais because this, this is egregious, and it's, he's aware of it. He's, he's actually commented on it in some of his emails, and he's still embedded in the process, all phases of the process, and directing staff. And so I feel sorry for the staff because they're subject to his direction, even though, okay. Thank you. It. All right, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Two minutes. I'm Seymour Beek. I live on Balboa Island. I'm a longtime resident. And I have visited Marine Avenue many times and admire the trees on Marine Avenue. I think they contribute to a nice ambience for that locale. And I have spent very little time lying awake at night worrying about the risk of those trees falling on me. But the main message I have for you guys is I think that you should discourage any future planning Going, going forward with a grand plan that involves removal of the trees. I think they're important and important to a lot of people on the island. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. My name's Ed Black. I, I was gonna do an introduction, but uh, we're well past that. But I would like to uh, refer to uh, Mr. Warner's definition of value. Because we have we have different we have a different definition. Can you talk louder, please? Oh, we have a different definition. An LA Times reporter recently wrote a column about Marine Avenue, describing it as Rockwellian, inspired by the famous painter of Americana, Norman Rockwell. Walking amongst the towering trees, framing boutiques and cafes, I certainly feel the nostalgia. This hearkening back to an earlier time is exactly what draws tourists to the island from around the world, and the iconic trees are a big part of it. Balboa Island is arguably the jewel of Newport Beach, and Marine Avenue and its landmark trees are the center of that jewel. These trees are far more valuable to, these trees are far more valuable to me and most of the people here than apparently they are to Mr. Warner. Uh, the BIPA has retained the services of three certified independent arborists. The city hired their own arborist. For trees as historic and iconic as the ones on Marine Avenue, you would think both sides would want to compare all four evaluations in the interest of fairness and accuracy. Well, at least the BIPA did. The arborists have spoke to the, uh, the problems with the Warner Report. But I went through the report tree by tree, all the reports. And fully 10% of the eucalyptus trees, the BIPA arborists identified the trees as one species, and the city independent arborist identified it as another. If you can't even get the species right, you might assume there could be other discrepancies, and I would sure want to analyze these reports further before I went cutting down these magnificent trees. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Next speaker, please. Uh, my name is Randy Black. Um, my family has been in Newport Beach since 1926, uh, not as long as Mr. Beak, uh, but uh, fairly close. Um, we're being told here that the citizens are confused. They've confused these issues. Uh, we have not. Uh, the city's planned reconstruction of uh, Marine Avenue is inextricably linked with the removal of the historic trees. It's just easier and cheaper to install infrastructure if you don't have to work around historic elements. Um, you know, we're, we're being told it's too expensive to do testing on these trees. It's just easier to cheaper to pull them out and plant some very small 24 inch box trees and and it's cheaper and easier to do it all in one fell swoop you know let's get rid of 64 percent of the trees in the next year or so um and uh it, it's just cheaper and easier to do that um these people do not understand value uh, the, we people have talked about the cultural and historic value of this how about the economic value uh mature studies show that mature trees 
add 10 to 20 percent to the property values. They increase uh, retail rents by 9 to 12 percent. Uh, you know, they increase, um, uh, you know, the uh, retail spending by several percent uh, on average. So when we're saying, oh, we're going to rip out the trees because it's a few cents easier, uh, cheaper to, to do that, uh, we're leaving on the table, you know, much more money than that. And don't forget, you know, the iconic experience of Newport Beach is walking down ba Marine Avenue, buying a Balboa bar, getting a frozen banana, walking under a canopy of trees. Uh, this is famous to, you know, viewers of Arrested Development, the OC, et cetera. Uh, what are we going to do with these tourists when they come? Oh, you know, these little trees are fine, and um, we know it doesn't look like you we're kind of expecting it to look. Um, but, you know, it was cheaper and it was easier to uh, just do it all in one fell swoop uh, without, um, uh, you know, with, without uh, actually doing the testing and ev all the other risk analysis that really ought to be made. And I'll, I will just finish with saying we're being told here, oh, it's a process. There's a normal procedure. Move along. Nothing to hear here. Uh, but no, it's imminent. We're being told. There's going to be a PB&R meeting next, you know, next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, then we're going to remove 10 trees, and then we're going to remove another 27 trees, uh, and then we're going to um, reevaluate re the remaining few trees, all conveniently in time that we can do our massive reconstruction of Marine Avenue. Um, this is a council matter. We are looking to the council to give direction to staff on where they want to go with this. Um, you know, this, this is something where I would hope that uh, you will listen to the public opinion on sure. this matter. Sure. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Bach. Next speaker, please. Hello, Dennis Bress, Balbo Island, and uh, want to thank you so much, uh, Council, for having this study session. This is really informative. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, advocating uh, for uh, the community to engage with um, our council members and with our city. And I think what you're seeing right here is a great representation, Joy, of our um, great United States, right? That's the way this is supposed to work. So uh, thank you for the time. I did hear mention PBNR, so I'm looking forward to having a PBNR after this uh, meeting here. Uh, that's a Paps Blue Ribbon, by the way. <laughs> uh, so anyways, um, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, if anyone's gone to Orange in the Orange Circle, uh, you'll see what they were able to do up there. Uh, they have a great uh, city. It's like you're transported in time uh, when you get to the Orange Circle. Uh, that's basically what we're saying, and you guys are well aware of what we have on Marine Avenue. It's very special. So the bottom line is we have a discrepancy between some reporting based on taking 27 trees out or three out. I think we can deal with three trees for sure. Uh, we want and uh, need life cycle tree management for sure. Um, and I understand the timing based on things. But we have empty wells right now, so I would say the sooner uh, we can get the city to get a uh, known eucalyptus replacement that you guys are recommending, and maybe we can give you some input there, then we could actually, as a community, see that tree and watch it being placed and understand conceptually what we're going to look at as we continue to go through this life cycle tree management. So the discrepancies between 3 and 27, that's what's got us all scared. Lack of communication and the fact that, and I'll be clear, I was down there in the morning, and when they started that tree trimming process, it was dark. And the guy in the bucket at the top that was doing the supposedly very specific tree trimming had a hard hat on with a flashlight. And how can the supervisor give him information to make those cuts? And by the end of that process, there were a bunch of limbs on the ground. So starting out in the dark is not a good thing. So it's a series of events. So I'm just asking for two things. One, a moratorium on tree cutting. And as I understand it, you're going to warn us before trucks come down there to, to cut any trees, correct? So we don't have to be worried. And two, let's form the Balboa Island Preservation Committee. And that would be a group of people who would interface with you and staff and communicate back with the BIPA and the BIIA for all the residents of Balboa Island. So thanks for everything you're doing and keep up the good work. We want to engage and work with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Sullivan, Mike Sullivan here. I've lived on Marine Avenue for 40 years. I heard a phrase two hours ago. I heard a phrase two hours ago, the right tree for the right spot. Now, being that this is a study session, let's see what is the right tree for the right spot. So um, why don't we hear from each one of our experts to come up here and say what he thinks is the right tree for this particular spot, and let's go home. All right, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. My name's Dick Ashoff, and I live on Babel Island. Very easy, you have a great example of what can happen. Take a walk over to Balboa Village. They took all those trees out. They haven't been replaced. There are pots. It's barren. So all I ask is once the trees are gone, they're gone. So tread lightly. You have a great example to look at. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comments? Please come forward. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, why don't I bring it back to the dais and ask my colleagues to speak. Mr. Muldoon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am no tree hugger, but I am a sap. <laughs> and my wife and I, our first date, we walked around Balboa Island. And there's something incredibly special about what we have. I can only, only think of a couple other streets in Orange County that really compete. El Camino Real at San Juan Capistrano, Laguna Beach's Main Street, perhaps Old Town Orange's Circle. I believe that there is a middle ground that we can reach between three and 10 plus 17. And that's my simple request. I, I do think that there is a nexus. I don't think Councilwoman Brenner that staff is being um, necessarily doing this of their own volition. So I don't think that um, it is always of their own free will, but I do think that there's something going on that causes us all to have pause and say, this is not right how it's been done. It's easily corrected. Uh, let's put a moratorium on uh, trimming, which we wouldn't do anyways, and also taking down the trees. Let's consult with these other experts as well, as well as Mr. Warner. Uh, let's include the new technology that was used to analyze these trees. And let's be incredibly selective, hoping to do, remove no more than three trees, get some new trees in those wells quickly, sooner rather than later, so those have a chance to be tall. And then we continue the cycle in a thoughtful way that protects the charm of Marine Avenue. So I'm going to indicate to staff at this study session that that is my desire of staff. Um, I'm not going to make an motion. I don't want to put any of my colleagues on the hot seat, but that, that is my articulation of staff, and my colleagues are welcome to join. I think that's reasonable. All right, well, hold your thoughts here. We'll go down the line. Uh, Mr. Avery, do you have any comments? Yeah, I do. Um, that, the question of value is what I was thinking about and was brought up by several people, and um, certainly it's not the retail value of the tree as it exists now, or maybe the retail value of the sapling, it's the value of the community, and I think it's been expressed here quite well, and, and I think everyone who's in this town knows it, and when you go over that bridge and you see those trees, you're just going up, and it's just, it's iconic. And uh, so, um, and uh, they're very expensive, you know, if you're going to keep trees like that, just like on Palm Avenue, where it was completely denuded, I mean, that was crazy to me. I lived on the Balboa Peninsula Point when I was a kid for years, and those trees were there. Um, and so what that means is we have to put more money. We value those trees so much. We value the trees on Marine Avenue. We used to value the trees on Palm Avenue. But those trees, to my view, should have been saved. No doubt they were doing a lot of root, uh, roots were doing a lot of damage, but there's lots of things you can do to contain those roots and work around it. But it would have taken time and effort and money. But I think most of the people in the community would probably say, yes, it's worth it because of the value there. And I feel the same way about the Babel Island trees. We need to do everything we can to preserve them, to save them, and um, recognize what this community is saying, it, that we have to spend a little extra money, whatever it takes, really, because this is like a historic district, and the trees are a vital part of it. And my last comment would be uh, the staff here and Public Works is tremendous. We have the greatest staff, and it really, it, it really gets me when they are disparaged by people. I understand the fear, and like all of us, everybody makes mistakes, but um, 
they're they're terrific in this in this because I've worked with them and I've seen them and it's just been a pleasure. So um, I uh, this was this is a great meeting for me because you just feel the passion of this town and what a special place uh, Balboa Island is. So um, I, I think the message is very clear. I don't think you have to worry about the trees. and I, I, I don't have to worry about them because I feel the same way as you do because my wife and I go around Balboa Island about three times a week, so we see them. But um, I, I agree with Joy in the sense that we need to really work hard. I'm not online. I don't go online for the reason that I heard about the, the vilification, the nastiness, it's just uncalled for when we can get together and meet and talk as a community. That's all I've got to say, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Duffy. Thank you, Mayor. Whew, I've never been nervous before <clears throat> to talk. <clears throat> Holy moly, I hope I say the right thing. Uh, I just think that um, the priority of our staff has always been to do things as, as uh, economically reasonable as possible, and I think their approach was exactly that. And as well as when they factor in what happened on Irvine Boulevard, you know, that just never leaves our mind. So I think they uh, were doing their, the right thing in their, as, as we have instructed them. However, at, at this meeting, what I'm hearing is we need to reprioritize and spend more money. And I think that's what I'm hearing. Um, I know it's hard to get money out of the finance committee. I've been trying for three years to, but anyway, that's I think in a nutshell that um, I would agree with. I didn't originally agree with uh, Councilman Muldoon, but as the evening progressed, I I would have to say I'm in his camp. But also I want to say what Councilman Avery said that I have deep respect for our our staff, and they do not come to work thinking they're out to screw us. That's not what they do, okay? It's all about priority and saving money, and that's, I think, what was in their mind. So and now if we change, shift gears a little bit, maybe we can offer some uh, a better solution. Thanks. All right, I'll skip over here. Ms. Brenner. Um, I, w I just wanted to say to Mr. Sullivan, if it were the right tree for the right spot, if we were starting in the very beginning, that would be different, but now we've got some of the wrong trees in spots that we love, and so we're having to work around that and try to maintain the history and the charm and the character of places that we love. And um, I just wanted to mention one thing. What I said earlier about, I, I liked um, Dennis Bress's term of life cycle management because when I was talking before about Poppy Avenue, um, Dave, would you show, do you have those slides of what Poppy Avenue looks like now? We used to have beautiful eucalyptus trees on that street, and back in the 80s when we recommended some of them be taken out because they were dangerous, um, and they didn't, what happened was that it got to the point that it was so bad that we had to take all of those trees out, and our city staff worked so hard with the residents of Cronomar and Poppy in particular to come up with something that they could um, could get behind and that was before what they looked like but our sidewalks were ramped and we had little signs that say walk with at your own risk sort of in the dark but it was they were very dangerous and so eventually we got to the point because we weren't replacing them gradually um, we got to the point that we had to take them all out, and this is what it looks like now. And the si we have beautiful straight sidewalks and straight streets, but we lost the charm that we had from those eucalyptus trees. So it's going to be beautiful when they grow up a little bit. We're not worried about that, but if we had gradually replaced those eucalyptus trees along the way to make sure that we always had healthy specimens, we might have been able to maintain that charm that we had on Poppy Avenue. And I also wanted to mention what Duffy referred to about the cost consideration by the staff. This council in particular has been pushing on staff for years now about watching the money. And so when they come up with a plan, I think they do often come up with what they're gonna be able to do with the most economically. 
and not consider perhaps the reaction of the community. So in this case, the process has worked. It's like everybody got involved, everybody became aware, and everybody let the staff and the council know that more money may need to be spent, but that we want that charm and that character maintained. And I would just like to applaud everyone who spoke today because everyone was very concise and professional and um, articulate and, and respectful. And um, I, I know I've led m movements like this before, and I always made a point of making sure to tell people, you don't get people to do what you want by, by um, insulting them. So everyone was, was great today, and I know in, in times past, I've always tried to be respectful, and I just wanted to apologize. I think one time I was rude to Duffy, and so I, wanna, I, wa <laughs> I want to apologize if I was ever rude to you, Duffy. So, but I thought, I thought people today did a great job, and I really appreciate that. So, um, and I, I wanted to suggest that we make sure all the reports are submitted to PBNR. I would like to make sure that the PBNR Commission see all the reports that have been done by all the arborists, whoever they were authorized by, and that they be um, hopefully advised that we can do testing on certain trees if there's any question about trees that we might not might be able to save for a little bit longer. But I also hope to see that we have a healthy process of, and can we stop saying removing trees and start saying replacing trees? <laughs> just, just routinely don't say we're removing trees, we are replacing trees. And Ron Yeo in Corona Del Mar has been our guardian of the trees. Ron Yeo, every time a tree is taken out, he is on the staff like glue making sure that a tree is replaced in a timely manner. And I think maybe that's something that the citizens can really be aware of and help us with to make sure that if there are trees taken out, I know someone sent us an email that said there were trees um, that had not been replaced on Opal that were removed. So if we can make sure that we are really vigilant about getting those trees replaced. One little thing I'd like to tell you is when I was chair of the Parks Commission, there was a little two by two inch article in McCall's magazine that I tore out and it was said Tree City USA. And I gave it to one of my other commissioners and I said, would you see if we can become a Tree City USA? And that was the beginning of our becoming part of the Arbor Day Society. And, and we are a, a tree city, we love our trees. and. If we all work together, we can make sure that they are maintained and preserved and that we are able to be proud of our community and the way it looks. Uh, thank you, well said. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yep, so, um, I mean, this, so this morning we received a, a demand letter from attorneys representing the BIPA and two, two of the four pages in there talked about the charter's requirement for the Parks, Beach and Rec Commission and also our, uh, our council policies dealing with this. And they, the demand is that we follow the charter and the council policies, so let's do that. So it goes through the Parks, Speech, and Rec Commission. Even a moratorium needs to go through the Parks, Speech, and Rec Commission. That's their job uh, to make these recommendations to us. So send it to them um, and give the options. I mean, ha let them have options. If It's not just an option of which trees to be removed, um, three, or the 10 uh, as recommended, but give the option and the cost um, of what it would be to do a level three and see if they wanna do that. Um, and then give the option of a moratorium and see if they wanna do that. But that's, that's kind of the point of why we put these seven folks on is to make these decisions and recommendations. So uh, you know, that's, if that's the demand, let's do it. Okay, well, let me bring this part of the day uh, to conclusion to sum up what my colleagues are saying and see if I can say this right. I think this has been a very healthy process and I echo Council Member Brenner's comments. This has been, but for the clapping, everything's been in order and the clapping is, is not such a bad thing. So I, I wanna thank on many levels that this, I often say this when I'm complimenting the community on their involvement and engagement and activism that it takes a small group of loud voices to make public policy and 
and and that's a good thing too. And our job as Mayor Pro Tem just explained that we have to weigh all these inputs and work and direct staff to help us all as a community do the right thing. I will say it's hard to think that anyone is uh, divided on the question of should we protect and replace our trees. I mean, I think we are in violent agreement. <laughs> we want to protect our community character. We want to protect all that makes us special. We want to protect our trees and replace those that need replaced. The question that we're coming down to today is how many trees are truly diseased or hazardous to our health? And let's turn it over to the, uh, our Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission to work with staff. Uh, if cost is what is uh, restrained looking at, to the level three testing, uh, I think staff is hearing from us that let's do level three testing for crying out loud. Uh, let's not guess, let's be precise and use, as we've heard from the professionals several times this evening, that much science has uh, progressed over the last 25 or 30 years, so we really can understand the kinds of situations, the predicament or the health of our trees. Let's make this standard for these uh, special trees as are so designated in our council policy. Uh, maybe I, we will at a future point revise or update uh, our council policy that all special trees should go through an extreme vetting process just to make sure. And from a cost standpoint, and I too, as Mr. Duffield said, appreciate cost, uh, staff's consciousness about cost. Ironically, uh, sometimes aggressive tr uh, tree trimming and removal is costly too. And so let's kind of find a balance. I think the testing is the missing link in all of this, that we do one f deeper level of testing. So just to repeat what's been said so staff is clear, uh, let's find a middle ground, and I think as we're all saying, there's somewhere between three and 10 or three and 27 over the next five years, what is the plan for assessing the health of these trees? And we know wherever, frankly, if we, and we are Tree City, when I first got, when we all have been on the council and participating in Arbor Day every April, and I learned that we are a tree city. So we have, what did, what did you say, Mr. Picard? We have 30,000 trees? 37,000 trees? 35,000 trees. 35,000 trees in our city. We have a, a professional person, and we had, uh, prior to that, we've always had a professional managing our tree process. So I don't know how many cities have a paid professional staff member managing our tree process. So I, I commend prior councils that we have we invest in the professional management of our trees. And as we went through this in our February study session, and maybe people were thinking, why are we spending 35 minutes on trees? But I'm glad we did, because that was the grounding, the foundation of why we care so much about our trees. And clearly our community cares. It's part of our character. It's part of our property values. We care. We're really talking about process and the, and the speed of what we do. So let's find a middle ground. Let's do the extra testing. Uh, we have, in effect, uh, a de facto moratorium because PB&R is going to go through their analysis on September 3rd. It's going to come to the council. We are probably several months away from any tree disappearing off, off Marine Avenue. I'm sorry? I'm sorry, what? It doesn't guarantee... It, it wouldn't normally come back to council after because you've delegated that task of PBNR. But if you'd like it to come back to council, well, let, let me just say that let's bring it back. Absolutely, frankly, I would, I, I would like to. I think we all would like to know what the final resolution is, so we're all clearly on the same on the same page. So have it bring back to council, so there'll be more public discussions of this. Consult with experts. I think it is a good idea uh, to bring all these reports and to. Uh, just weigh them all and give them equal weight in terms of their relevance in a particular area. And replace the trees when needed. We test with new technology. Uh, preserve absolutely whatever we can. Test and say PB&R's role. Uh, and I want to thank staff. I, too, commend staff. Doing the right thing is, is what they do well, and I appreciate that. And I hope that they haven't felt... Uh, and to be put in a defensive position 
too badly. You have to defend your professional expertise and acumen and, and giving recommendations to staff, and I appreciate you doing that. I want to thank the community for being here for two hours today, over two hours, to speak on a matter that's very, very important to all of us and to realize we're all together on this subject. We, we all want to do the right thing. So without further comment, oh, Mr. Muldoon, did you want one more comment? Yeah, just well, quickly. Uh, so the citizens paid for the technology to be spent right in every tree. Um, is that, can that be considered when we do our analysis at PVNR and subsequently at council? Uh, yes, it can. So we're saving the cost that we could normally spend because of citizens group. Thank you for your activism. And I appreciate, Mayor, what you said, which is that it's going to go through a public slow process uh, and the residents will have a say. Yeah. Perfect. Very much. Very much so. You are part of this process. So thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Let me find where we are. Yeah, well, I will. Uh, please leave quietly and we'll proceed to... Okay, let me ask staff. Oh, welcome back. We're not done, ma'am. Not right. <laughs> um, could we exit quietly, please? We have another item on our agenda. Shh, please, please be quiet. Quiet, quiet. quiet. <laughs> please, we're not adjourned. If you could please uh, exit quietly, we're not adjourned. Um, Miss City Manager, we have a water rate presentation. Uh, do we have enough time? Plus, we have a closed session agenda. So, well, all right. I just want to get her opinion. I know we do. So, how much time do you need? So, the the presentation's about twenty. I can try to have them squeeze it down to fifteen minutes. Okay, um, if we talk fast. Okay. Talk fast. All right. Um, Let's go. Okay. All right, let me just introduce the item. It's the 2019 water rate study. The utilities department is leading the effort to review the rates associated with the water enterprise fund. The previous water rate study was completed in 2009 and the last rate increase for water users was in 2014. The purpose of this presentation is to present a PowerPoint summary of the financial analysis, the draft water rates, receive input, and seek the city council's direction to bring the item back for formal city council agenda item. Again, this is a study session. We are not voting, and we'll be bringing this back possibly in at a future meeting in September. All right, Mr. Vukovic. All right, thank you, Mayor, uh, council members. Uh, I want to introduce Sanjay Gar, who is our uh, rate consultant from Rough Tellus, and then also Stefan Catron, who's our utilities manager. So we're going to get right into this and move along pretty quickly here. Some of the basic points, executive summary here too. We've had a lot of discussions about water over the last uh, year, and here we are talking about you know the costs of our water system have gone up. We haven't had a rate increase since 2014, so five years with no rate increases, and there's costs and expenses that that need to be made up, and we are recommending a rate increase, and we'll go through that. Uh, the outline of the presentation is in the packet there for you as well, too. So like I said, we've been to council many times over the last nine months. We've talked about the water master plan. We've talked about the water rate study. We've talked about, um, uh, and we've also been to the finance committee, going over the financials and all of the, the, the different needs for the water system. Um, you know the basics of our system, 300 miles of pipe, which if you just take a second and think about that, 300 miles of pipe, and of course 26,000 customers, it is kind of mind-blowing. Uh, the big decision that council made uh, through our recommendation was our water master plan, which increased capital expenditures by about $2.2 .2 million annually uh, in order to maintain the system adequately. And in the past, we've showed you pictures of failures and stuff. You remember the Jamboree water main break, and, and you've seen other pictures too. And, and, and um, when these systems fail, they cause a lot of damage and, and uh, quite a big uh, mess out there. And so uh, pipes break no matter how well you plan for them, but it is our responsibility to plan as best we can for the replacement, for the operation and maintenance, and the financials of the system. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sanjay. Um, oh, real quick, uh, you know, talk about customer service for our utility. Um, we, uh, you know, we have 24/7, uh, 24 hours a day. We have staff ready to respond. We are constantly monitoring our, our system, and of course, we provide all kinds of different services in terms of leak detection. 
Um, this graphic up top, I think, kind of uh, um, illustrates, you know, kind of an important point. What can you get for a penny nowadays? Well, for a penny, you can get two and a half gallons of water delivered pressurized clean to your house. And, you know, it, it happens that way for a lot of different reasons. But the overarching thing is, is that, that the water utility operates as an enterprise fund. It's not a part of the general fund. But it's spent only for those purposes. The money received and the money spent is only for the purposes of water. And it has a whole separate and segregated um, accounting and financial reporting. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sanjay, who's going to jump into the financials. Thank you, Mark. Honorary Mayor, City Council staff, I'd like to present um, Raftel's summary of its report. Um, so a couple of backgrounds associated with the study. The last rate study that was occurred, or last, excuse me, increase that occurred was in 2014. Um, so no increases in rates have occurred over the last five years. Since then, the cost of purchasing water, you purchase water from two sources, Orange County and from Metropolitan Water District, has increased by 75%. In addition, in 2015, we had the state declaring a historical drought. Newport was successful in cutting back by 20%. And as Mark mentioned, um, we do have a new master plan study with an increase of 2.2 annual increase to $7.2 million. So the goals and objectives of the study are threefold. First is a financial plan to look at all the various cost components associated with it, which we took into account. The second is to develop a reserve policy that takes into account future risk specifically associated with drought condition. And the last thing is to enhance revenue stability while at the same time this is the balancing act, meaning affordability and community um, communication associated with conservation signaling. With the reserve policies, we did a comprehensive review. We discussed this with staff and the Finance Committee. What we're recommending is threefold reserves. One is an operating reserve for cash flow needs. Second is a capital reserve for awarding contracts and to also have opportunities where there might be a situation where Mark can um, get a better bid by doing certain things such as a street being repaired, he can go in there, fix it. Uh, there's opportunities there, so it creates flexibility in the system. The third is a rate stabilization fund to deal with drought conditions. We do take into account the cost of your of purchasing water, the avoided cost. Basically, we're suggesting something to deal with the next drought. Hopefully it doesn't occur, but if it does, we'll have that. So this is a summary of the table associated with the reserve policies. The first two columns is your current policy. The, the second two column is our proposed, and the bottom line is the target. As you can see, we are slightly increasing the reserve policy by a slight amount. The next... Can, uh, I, can I just ask you to just yes. explain, just for the public record, that why we need a reserve when... What happens when there is a drought and less water is consumed? Correct. So when so there's a conception there that you're paying you do pay for the purchase of water right but there is also additional cost this is that hidden cost that Mark discussed which is the ability to use water 24 7 7 days a week and that's a fixed cost nature associated with it so as people use less water that cost is still there and the idea of a rate stabilization fund is to draw that down during those conditions so we don't have to tell our customers please conserve, oh, and we're sorry, we have to increase your rates. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have that mixed sorry. message. So we're doing, it's basically almost like an insurance in the sense of okay. dealing with a drought in the future. Okay, good. Thank you. The next now, based on all this information, we've developed a financial model, and this is a, basically shows the ending fund balance. The blue bars are the ending fund balances and what we're estimating the, to be in the future. The red line is the reserve target that I just mentioned. And as you can see, in fiscal year 2020, we're below the target, and then by fiscal year 2024, we're negative. So some kind of revenue adjustment increases in rates is needed. Based on dialogue, discussion with staff, finance committee, and some stakeholders, what we're recommending is a 7.4% increase over the next five years. The first year, that would be basically for the average customer, $3.38 a month. Um, note one thing here is that blue bar is we're drawing down on reserves. So this is a plan on drawing reserves down. So we're not building up reserves. We, the reserve policy is higher, but we are drawing down on reserves in order to meet our goals. So now the increase. So w what we've done is, is we have slightly increased the fixed charge. Currently you collect around um, 31% of your fix, your revenue comes from the fixed charge. We're slightly increasing that to 34. Remember what I said earlier about that goal, the third objective, enhance revenue stability while maintaining affordability and conservation. So we're doing that by having a slight increase in the fixed charge. That also helps with future drought conditions. Ideally, we would increase that all the way, but if we did that, that would be a 25% increase on the fixed charge. 
and it wouldn't meet those objectives. Yeah, over here, you can see the different increases associated with different usage. So just uh, for people mm -hmm. just seeing this, so it, the typical consumer is there on the left column. Mm -hmm. Correct, 10 units. And then com commercial have a lot bigger pipes, Correct. so there's obviously a greater cost, so just Correct. to be clear. The next chart then basically shows the new fixed charge. As I mentioned, this fixed charge is slightly increasing more proportional than the volumetric in the first year. Um, you see the different fixed charges. We are standardizing. One of the things with water rates now is making sure there's a document that shows the math, the rationality for everything. That's something that we'll be providing next in our study. We call it administrative record, sorry for the jargon terminology, but shows the math. And one of the things we want to do is, is we want to be sure we're consistent with industry standards. So we're doing that with the meter chart. So that's why some of the meter rates, as you'll notice, the impact, they sort of vary by meter size. So we're making it consistent now with the standards associated with the meter size and the capacity. This is show, next shows the volumetric rate. Um, so that does slightly increase. And now the next slide shows the proposed rates. And so this would be in your Prop 218 notice um, where we're showing the rate schedule. Um, we are asking city council to consider, not today, but in the future, to consider um, um, adopting five years of rates. Um, and so this will be set for the next five years, city and, uh, and then it'll be to 2024. This is the next is the commodity rate associated with that. Um, next, I'll turn it over to Mark. Okay, thank you, Sanjay. And uh, so, you know, setting rates are a very public process, and, and you know, we are going to engage, start engaging that public process here too. The first being having this uh, this information, which has already been uh, posted up front of, uh, as of last week, and we're going to have additional information going out uh, um, to the public. And there's an important decision point we're planning for on September 10th, which is in a, the actual rate study report, and if City Council would authorize us to continue with that, which would be mailing a direct notice to every single uh, customer, every, every single of our 26,000 customers, a notice to them about the rates, and then continue with our public information and outreach through our utility bills and, and community meetings too. Frankly, we do a lot of community meetings and getting out there um, and talking to people about this. and. And uh, council will be asked to set a public hearing date for the future in November too, uh, as well. And uh, if this moves forward, it would set the rates to begin uh, in January. Um, there's additional slides backing up there too that have the fees for you know fire um, connection fees, uh, fire meters, also our recycled water system as well are all in there. All of those are in your packet. Uh, but for brevity, I'm just going to conclude the presentation there and answer any questions. I just ask a quick question on recycle. You just bring up recycled. Uh, some uh, residents are asking about the city's recycled water policy or master plan. Or could you speak real quickly on what we intend to do about that? Uh, sure. So we we do have a small portfolio in the recycled water system too. We're always looking for ways where we can expand that. And in fact, we have projects on the books where we're going to be connecting some additional streets and 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 things like that. Streets, street medians in particular. Um, but expanding the system really requires, you know, some sort of, you know, master plan to kind of look at it holistically. We have a lot of studies that we've done over the years, and frankly, it's a, it's a big investment to build the infrastructure for the pipes and pumps to get to these areas that, are, that need to use large amounts of water. We're happy to look at that after this study's done and maybe come, to, come together with some uh, sort of short master plan that looks at that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, real quick, I just wanna point something out to my colleagues. Could you go back to, I think it's gonna be, it's the slide that's titled Status Quo Financial Plan Fund Balance. Yeah, that one. So I just want to point this out real quickly for my colleagues. The, this, what this is saying is if we don't increase rates, we will go into a deficit. Um, and we've uh, had this conversation, or the council has had this conversation before uh, dealing with the uh, wastewater. So I just want to point out that uh, enterprise funds, uh, this is more for the public, enterprise funds are about as close to running government like a business as you can get. The only difference is it's a monopoly and you can't make a profit. So in this particular case, we can't spend, we can't charge more than we take in and um, we can't take in more than we spend. I should probably rephrase that. And so the, the important thing is as we've gone through and seen this, you know, when you don't have rate increases for five years, uh, you have to increase the rates more than you would have had we done this five years ago. And so that's part of the equation. But most importantly, the expenses have dramatically gone up in terms of 
the the cost of water and also when we approved the water master plan which was necessary we saw construction costs going significantly up so we've seen costs going up which is why we have to match that on the on the uh, fee side but i just want to point this out thank you very good are there any other questions up here seeing none uh why don't we go to the public please come forward tim stokes i just wanted a, a question of how what percentage of the city is is serviced by Newport Beach water? I know I'm not. I'm on IRWD, and then also, is that rate com com uh, compatible with an IRD IRWD rate? Is it market value? That's a very good question. Let me ask Mark, please, to respond. Sure. Um, our service area for Newport Beach water is about seventy percent of the city's um, you know, geographic limits. Um, the proposed rates are still very competitive with our neighbors. Um, and uh, Sanjay, who, who's done um, you know, lots of presentations about rates and, and rate structures, can speak further about any of those details. Every system's a little bit different. You know, for example, like Irvine Ranch has a property tax you know, component to theirs. Ours does not. You know, some charge for capital, some don't. Some have a hidden, uh, some have a pass-through where they, where they uh, you know, put put it in for the actual cost of water. And so there's different versions of this and rates. Ours is very simple and straightforward, uh, but it is very competitive with our neighbors. Sanjay, did you want to make any other comment? Yeah, I mean, the only one thing I would like to say is that if, I mean, to make this apple to apple, just imagine that $7.2 million that we're funding annually was taken off the table and was put on the property roll. That would be the way to look at us versus Irvine. So that's what Irvine does. They're and then you pay it through your property tax. Yeah. You, you, your rates only pay for operating costs at Irvine Ranch. Oh. So that's the way to look at it. Oh, that's interesting. <clears throat> Mr. Mosier. Mayor Dixon, members of the council, <clears throat> my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, I, I sat through those two finance committee meetings struggling to try to understand what was being presented, which rapidly became very, very complicated. We heard about this reserves risks, uh, trying to anticipate unknown amounts of demand that we might have for water in the future, and the risk that if the demand for water went down, we would have to tell people that they're going to have to pay even more to keep the pipes running. A after sitting through those and not quite understanding what the presentation was about, it occurred to me, or it seemed to me, to my simple mind, that much of this complication, which you didn't he hear much about today, is kind of self-created in the sense that we are, so some past council has made a conscious decision to undercharge for the infrastructure needs, the cost. To, to, to my simple mind, the wa water system has kind of a fixed standby cost to keep the pipes maintained, even if there was no water being taken out of the system, keep the pumps operable and so forth. And then there's a variable cost as water is drawn out of it, which should be pretty much proportional to the number of gallons that are dispensed. It has to do with the cost of buying water, has to do with operating the pumps, has to do with chemicals and so forth. Why as a baseline don't we actually just charge the total fixed cost that we need to our customers, bite the bullet, do that once, and then actually charge the correct cost for the water that we're receiving. And the state law now, as we heard, actually allows us to pass through the cost. In that case, when the consumption goes up and down, we're not in this bind. Do we have enough reserve? Are we at the right percent, so forth? So to, to my simple mind, I'm wondering why we don't start that as the baseline that we consider and then ask ourselves, why are we doing something different than that? Which gets us into all these complications and uncertainties as to how the future is going to work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you want to respond to that? That's a good question. I, I would, do you mind if we bring it back? Because I want to respond to it too. You can wait. Well, let me ask staff to respond, then you can respond. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I mean, um, so there, that has been a dialogue in the community, in the water industry, to increase the fixed charges to reflect the fixed costs, and that would be an ideal world to do that. The challenge associated with that would be that, and this is just an estimate, your fixed charge for a residential, which we're proposing right now is $20.35, would most likely be around $30. Mm -hmm. So it's a $10 additional cost. 
So, and so what will happen is the commodity rate would drop by half too. So the, the affordability concern that we had with certain individuals who have a fixed income, who've been in this community for a long period of time, also the conservation signal message will be sort of gone. So this is the balancing act, and this is the challenge that water agencies face, is revenue stability, affordability, conservation signal, and how do you juggle these three things? So what we've done here, and we've talked a little bit about this in the finance co committee, is increase the fixed charge to an amount that we feel comfortable mm -hmm while still maintaining, that's why the objective there, affordability and conservation. And we feel like we have that balance with this rate structure. Okay, very good. Uh, Mayor Potem. Can you go two slides forward? Yeah, that one. So we actually, we ran analysis at the Finance Committee to see what it would look like if we started increasing the fixed cost. And a funny thing happens. Um, it starts leveling out really, really fast. So if you are someone who is using very little amount of water, you're going to start paying very similar to someone who is paying four or uh, using four or five times the amount of water. And so when you, and the reason for that is it, sh it should be fairly obvious if the vast majority of what you're paying is on the infrastructure side, on the fixed cost side, and your fixed cost is very high, then what'll happen is the very low variable rate uh, will create zero incentive for anyone to cut back on their water it's just a really, it's, yeah, it's, it's bad policy. And um, Tim, I'm sorry, are you, are you in IRWD or Mesa? Interesting. So IRWD, you know, when you look at your bill, it has four or five tiers associated with it. That is an incredibly complicated Prop 218 notice that you have to go through. And they've done it because they wanted to do it for a certain amount of reasons. But one of the reasons they're able to do it, it's exactly right. You, you pay for it on your property tax too. So uh, Mesa's not, Mesa's not, well, anyway, I'm not going to get into Mesa, the, but very different. They just we just do it differently. So interesting, though. So anyway, the um, I just want to point that out. That was something we considered, and it's weird because you start actually doing it where some, I mean, the increase is just staggering on someone who's only using ten, um, and, and it does not. It's just. It's <laughs> well. Um, just curiously, if, I'm not proposing this. I'm just curious if the IRWD push it through property taxes, push that fixed cost through property taxes, is that creating a false impression to the user that their water rates are lower because they don't really remember paying it in their property tax? <laughs> Just a thought. I don't know, Mayor, that's, that sounds like a trick question. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I need to think about anyway, that. Anyway, we, no, we, are, we are transparent and full disclosure in Newport Beach. Well, and simple. I mean, the, the key point here is, is there's two billing units, your meter size and how much you use, you know. And so anyone looking at their bill can quickly understand. And, and the more they save, uh, the, the less water they use, the more they save, too. So it has all those benefits. Okay. Any other questions up here? Any other public questions, I should say? I'm sorry. I meant to go back. Yes, Good evening, I'm Hoi Yang Yip. Well, first I want to say thank you. Water is very complicated. A lot of, huge amount of invisible work and most people don't know. So um, I support increasing rates, increasing rev uh, reserve and more recycled water. Now, um, I knew tiered rates was looked at. Um, I talked to a few different water districts and everyone I talked to, they have tier rates. So there must be a reason, but that's just pretty common, that practice. Um, it does encourage conservation. Now, since this is the time we have to increase the rates, I would say if it's possible, might as well just combine all the reasons together, just do the one shot because we'll have to wait for a few years. Looking at the big picture, I mean, one, water is very cheap. And I mean, um, if I pay $5 more per month, looking at the big picture, I mean, how much you pay for the dog stuff, right? And how much we conserve. And recently, we have been hearing news about some major international destinations running out of water one after another, and each time is a huge shock internationally. So this just echo to the fact that we're having more extreme weathers, which means the drought will get a drier, possibly longer. Now, luckily, we will not run out of water because Poseidon is making sure we're not going to run out of water, right? So now, 
I'm sure most people don't want to use Poseidon water. So this is a time we really just need to be water wiser to really be frugal with the resources we have. Um, just my two cents, this is the opportunity to really save water since we're increasing the rates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments, please come forward. See none, we'll bring it back here. Any more comments from staff, any other thought? All right, so we will see you again in September, September 10th, where we will bring it to public discussion. All right, thank you very much. And were you gonna say something? Oh, uh, no, if, if we're done with this item, I was just uh, wanted to see, Madam Mayor, if you wanted to recess to 7.15, say, to give a little bit of time. Um, All right, we still have to do overall public comments, so let me do oh, cool. overall yep. public comments and come back to that question. Any other overall public comments on non-agenda items? <laughs> I didn't quite follow. Are you doing the closed session? We will be doing closed session, but right now we're just doing overall public comments. So you can make comments on closed session. Yeah, I, oh, I, I see what you're, I didn't understand your question. Okay. I, I, I wanted to this, thank the staff for on the agenda explaining what the closed session initiation of litigation is about. And I wanted to note that it appeared to it, it generated at least one written comment from one resident interested in the topic. The topic that's announced here is the uh, city of Boise a case which involves the enforcement of anti-camping laws. If I understand the legal, gob legal gobbledygook here, you're um, considering adding your name to somebody else's petition, possibly joining somebody else's brief. Uh, I wanted to point out my own comment about this is I hope that doesn't cost very much for the following reasons. Number one, this case is just at the petition stage now. The city of Boise has hired Mr. Ted Olson, who is leading their team. The city of Newport Beach itself has used him in the past. He's apparently very good, so I am wondering, number one, that we agree that the decision should be appealed. Number two, exactly what we're gonna add to their very competent team, so. Um, if it costs very much, I don't really think it's in our interest to be doing it. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other public comments on non-agenda items? All right, bring it forward. Um, Mr. Harp, do you wanna talk about the closed session? Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. The City Council adjourned a closed session to meet with the city's labor negotiators, including the city manager, assistant city manager, and human resources, uh, resources director regarding labor negotiations with the Lifeguard Management Association and to meet with legal counsel to decide whether to join as an amicus in the case of Robert Martin versus City of Boise, and all that set forth on the agenda under items 4A and B. Thank you. All right, and because we are running right up to the seven o'clock hour, we will be adjourned until 7.15, where we will re resume the, re the regular session. Thank you. Let me get myself organized. Okay, we're round two here. Uh, call the meeting to order for the August 13th regular session of the Newport Beach City Council. Let me get my right glasses on here. Madam Clerk, roll call. The record will reflect that all members of council are present. Uh, current business, so we'll clarify. Wait a minute, am I on the right page here? Hold on. I know I'm going to get to, I'm still in the study session here. All right, uh, is there a closed session report, Mr. City Attorney? Uh, thank you, Mayor Dixon. We do have a report this evening. In regards to the case entitled Robert Martin versus City of Boise, which is listed on the agenda as item number 4B, a motion was made by Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill and second, seconded by Council Member Brenner to join the litigation as amicus. The motion was unanimously approved by the City Council. Robert Martin is the lead plaintiff in this case, and the other plaintiffs include Lawrence Smith, Robert Anderson, Janet Bell, Pamela Hawks, and Basil Humphrey. The City of Boise is the only defendant. And this lawsuit primarily relates to camping on public property and the enforcement of anti-camping ordinances. 
The city of Boise is seeking review of the Ninth Circuit's decision before the United States Supreme Court. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to um, announce that we have the invocation by Pastor Jorge Molina, Mariner's Church in Irvine, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by, led by Council Member Muldoon. Please. Dear God, thank you so much, Father, for today. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather here. I pray, Father, for wisdom, wisdom for our leaders and discernment. Thank you for the opportunity we have to gather and hear what you are doing in this wonderful town, Lord. Pray, Father, for your blessing on those that are here. Amen. Join me in the pledge. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 Amen.
I also attended a monthly meeting with the Corona de Mar Residents Association Executive Committee. I filmed a tour of the new Corona de Mar Branch Library for Newport Beach TV with the head librarian, Anika Helmuth. Um, I met with Grace, Dave Webb, and uh, traffic engineer Tony Brine and others to discuss ways that we can make sure traffic is a major consideration in our planning. I had originally proposed that we have a traffic affairs commission and we're looking at ways that we can save staff time but still accomplish the same goal of having traffic be a major consideration in everything that we do. Um, I attended the Costa Mesa Network for Homeless Solutions, which was a group of about 12 people that met at the Costa Mesa City Hall. This is 12 of about 24 people that work on the homeless issue in Costa Mesa. These were the most welcoming people. They were so eager to share everything that they've already been doing in the area of homelessness because they were part of a lawsuit. They are ahead of us. We were not in that lawsuit. so. They are ahead of us in developing a lot of strategies and dealing with the homeless, and they are more than eager to share all of that information with us. It was a fascinating meeting. Um, Will, Diane, and I met with Mike Sinecori, Dave Webb, and the BII leadership and several Southern California Edison executive team members. It was our second meeting for them to come back and answer questions that we had posed in our first meeting looking for any ways that we could get help with undergrounding assistance and we came up with every creative idea we could think of and they came back with every reason why they couldn't do it and um, it was <laughs> it was very disappointing but we're trying we're still trying so that was an interesting meeting that's it okay mr. Herman I, too, uh, will be attending that veterans luncheon uh, along with you, Councilman Muldoon, so I will see you there. I'm not sure who else is going. I never got an invitation. You didn't? No. Go, come as my guest. <laughs> All right. Uh, along with uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Councilwoman Brenner, uh, I attended the Newport Beach Police Department Summer Teen Academy graduation. Uh, I served as a judge at the annual uh, Balbo Island Sandcastle Contest a couple of Saturdays ago. Um, <clears throat> I would say the last two weeks, I've spent most of my time in conversations with people about the homeless issue in our city, and I've spent a great deal of time answering email uh, about the Marine Avenue Rehabilitation Project. That's taken up hundreds of hours over the last couple of weeks. Thank you. I'm Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> Got to spend a lot of time with our police department. We had the Newport Beach Police Department night out, uh, which was really well attended, especially by um, families. So I appreciate the efforts of all of our uh, police department to make that work, especially the uh, top brass who all were there. So thank you, Chief Lewis. And then I also attended the Newport Beach Teen Academy with um, Council Members Brenner and Herdman uh, and uh, was able to speak just a little bit. And it's really one of those things you, you get to enjoy looking at teenagers in our community who are getting out and uh, caring about community service so that that's special uh, office hours man I'm getting six to seven people at my <laughs> office hours so I just want yeah I know so I'm gonna, find the I'm chairs? gonna I'll advertise we did this time yeah so uh, I'm gonna advertise about three or four weeks ahead November 11th that's a number. Um, 8 to 10 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry I said November I meant September September 11th 8 to 10 a.m at the uh, Newport Coast Community Center. If you've never been there, which a surprisingly high number of people in Newport Beach have not, this is a great opportunity to come see the building. And then the last thing is TCA board meeting. Uh, I attended on behalf of Newport Beach. There's, um, there's a lot going on with the Foothill Eastern, not a substantial amount with San Joaquin, but I am planning on trying to spearhead an effort to create count, uh, finance policies. Interestingly enough, they don't have them. So I'm going to be talking with past Mayor Rush Hill and trying to work that through. And then do I, is my mentee here, Timothy? Yep. So we got my mentee from Newport Harbor High School here. So uh, thank you for being here. And that's it. Well, thank you. And I have a few announcements. And I'm missing one piece of paper. So I'll just have to get through what I have here. First of all, I want to congratulate our library. The California State Library has selected Newport Beach as a California History Section City of the Month. This distinction highlights core organizations involved in local cultural preservation and outreach, as well as the varied 
local history resources available to researchers at the State Library. And this is really what's really special. The California history section of our library holds a premier collection of documents from and about California's rich history as well as the city's history. And their vaults house thousands of rare books, maps, and newspapers, periodicals, in addition to a huge collection of unique photographs and letters. And in July, last July, in an effort to better support the work of local governments and historical societies in promoting and preserving the past, the California History Section started the City of the Month program as a companion to their County of the Month program. And so Newport Beach has been, library, Central Library has been recognized. And we also, just to the local history collection at the Central Library, it is unique, comprised of uh, rare documents relating to the City of Newport Beach. Um, all of you, I know, are excited, as we all are. The next concert on the green is Queen Nation, so I expect to see all of us there <laughs> dancing our hearts out. August 25th at 5 p.m. on the Civic Green, right out here, in a tribute to one of the most iconic groups in rock history, Queen Nation recreates the image, sound, and energy of a live Queen concert. And so we will rock you, Bohemian Rhapsody, if you saw the movie, you know what that's about, and we are the champions, so it's really going to be a fun evening. Visitors are encouraged to bring their beach chairs and blankets for an evening of fun. Uh, college application workshop in the Friends Meeting Room, August 31st at 10 a.m. to 11.30. The library is hosting a workshop to help high school students access the Common Application, the UC app, Coalition or any other app to assist students to submit the best college applications possible. Um, I'm holding up this, I don't know, I think there's a slide on this about Earth Day messages. Uh, do we have a slide on this? It's coming now. Okay, this is really exciting. A few months ago, you might remember that we had a mayor's contest, contest this past Earth Day uh, for water conservation and it was a national contest, and so our city's recreation and senior services department asked their preschool and after-school student, thank you, to create postcards that Councilmember Herdman is gonna show up right now with messages about what they would like to protect, oh, here they are, right here on the screen, to uh, protect planet Earth and why. Approximately 100 cards with handwritten messages and unique artwork were completed, bundled, and sent to my office. And here are a few colorful colors, covers. Some of the messages included, I will water plants and pick up every trash on the floor. I will use less water and pick up trash. I will take care of earth because we all need it later. It is also beautiful and we need it to stay that way. This is a wonderful example of educating our youth early on the importance of protecting our environment and resources for the future. It was really, really fun, and I'm really proud of that. I think when Mayor Gardner was mayor, you did the same thing, because I saw in the files letters to Mayor Gardner. <laughs> you started a great tradition. Okay, and then I think there's another slide. If all of you... Do you have, who's doing the slides? On the New York Times, I don't know how many of you woke up Sunday and opened the travel section of the New York Times and didn't know where to travel and you could travel right here to Newport Beach. They did a wonderful profile where Hollywood's Golden Age stars found safe harbor from Humphrey Bogart and his friends. They even talk about Duffy's. <laughs> I hope you saw the article, did you see it? Uh, and so I immediately sent the uh, clip of it to Grace and to Gary Sherwin and Gary wrote me back, I don't know if Gary's here tonight, but Gary, I visit Newport Beach, and Gary wrote me back and said that they orchestrated the whole public relations, media relations effort, and the reporter was here visiting Newport Beach in June or July and had been working on this story. So that was great public relations for the city and very proud of that. I, I think that's it on my announcement. Mr. Herdman, you wanted to agendize a future item proposal? Yes, um, I, I noticed there's uh, an entire front row of Fawn Bass people here, so if I'm uh, superseding no. you, um, it, we've had a request from Fawn Bass uh, who would like to insert membership applications in the return dog license envelope, so uh, I guess that requires uh, City Council approval, so I'm requesting that be a future agenda item. Okay, all right, very good, thank you very much. Let me just get 
Yeah. All right. Do we have public comments on uh, any of these items that the council members just brought forward? Did you want to say something, Mr. Stokes? Sure. Go right ahead. Good evening, Council. My name is Tim Stokes. I represent uh, President of the Friends of Newport Beach Animal Shelter. Uh, last year at this time, I reported um, some activities that uh, Von Boss was doing, and, and I want to uh, kind of remind everybody our mission is to provide uh, funding for extra medical care, specialized equipment, vocational education, and our aspirational goal is to find a forever home for our shelter. That means we're, we're uh, potentially purchasing the, the shelter. This year, I'd like to say we're about ready to do that. So we um, have a site in, 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 in mind. We're negotiating for that site. We are also um, started our pre-capital campaign funding. So we have the majority of our uh, funds in place before we start the public mm -hmm. side of our capital campaign. So we look forward to working with Carol Jacobs and the rest of the staff of getting um, this with the chief and, and Valerie Schromberg, who, the animal control that we work with at the facility. So the public-private partnership is live and well in Newport Beach. So public citizens can help out our city with these great uh, resources called extra uh, facilities and those types of things. So I'm very proud of that. I'd like to introduce some of my board here tonight. Eva Lebon, Evelyn Hart, Jean Watt, Nancy Gardner, and Robin Grant. You see, I'm, I'm on that couch that says outnumbered. That, that's, that's me, okay? I don't know what program that's on. Uh, so simple that. The other thing we, we, we have um, started this year, not only that, but we, we did um, set our sights into getting um, members for our, our organization. So we're calling that the founding membership campaign. And we came out with these beautiful categories such as puppies and kitties, tails, whiskers, paws, fat cats, and big dogs. You just have to give us a nice little donation and you, you, you can become one of those uh, uh, categories. And as um, the president of all the, all the unconditional four-legged animals in the city of Newport Beach. Um, Mayor Dixon, you sent me a beautiful check, or sent our organization a beautiful check. So I'm deeming you the number one founding member for oh. our organization. So congratulations. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm honored. Anything for our four-legged friends. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I'm proud. I will wear it with pride. And thank you. I mean, let me just give you a commercial because you all of you started about three or four years ago and you've been passionate about finding our own, our city's very own animal shelter. We've done it efficiently and economically. And because of your excellent work, you have found a very generous donor who's going to make this next chapter possible. And the public private process works. And it does. I, I'm it very does. Grateful. And we could use some more capital campaign donations so more we're, private we're, you more, want more more, more more private and then i encourage everybody to become a member and you get one absolutely of those i vouch for it's a great organization thank friends you. of newport beach animal shelter yeah thanks <laughs> all right thank you thank you ladies of the boards <laughs> thank you okay any other public comments please come forward see none madam clerk this is a time in which council members may pull items from the consent calendar for discussion. Those are items 1 through 14. Public comments are also invited on consent calendar items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. If any item is removed from the consent calendar by a council member, members of the public are invited to speak on each item for up to three minutes per item. All matters listed under consent calendar are considered to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. Council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending in action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the City Council votes on the motion unless members of the City Council request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Thank you. Mr. Avery, do you have any items to pull from the consent item? Mr. Duffield? Mr. Muldoon? I have none, but I have a recusal on two items, both due to real property interest. Although I think they're both out of the s s exact um, 500 yard or 500 feet uh, restriction just to be safe. I'm going to recuse myself on item number seven for real property interest and on item number 14 for the same. Uh, Ms. Brenner. Yes. Uh, Mr. Herdman. I have none. Mayor Potem. None. And I will be 
pulling item number 12. Do we have a motion? Yep. So I move the uh, balance of the consent calendar with item number one showing modifications of the minutes, item number three um, with the modifications in the, uh, in, that was provided to us in our yellow packet, item 11, uh, same thing, and then the items seven and 14 showing council member Muldoon recusal, and item number 12 being pulled by, council, or by Mayor Dixon. I'll second the motion. Very good. Uh, any public comments on the consent calendar on all items except for number 12? Please come forward. Okay. All right. Oh, here we go. <laughs> good evening. My name is Ruth Sanchez Kobayashi. Thank you all for uh, the service to our community. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for joining in the um, brief uh, for Martin versus Boise. It demonstrates a commitment to uh, not only helping the people in need in our community, but also preserving the quality of life for everyone. Um, I communicated to you via email uh, on that and the following two things, but I just wanted to also mention to you on item uh, number 14 on the grant approvals um, that series consideration be given to grant approvals for organizations where 75% of the people served are non-residents and um, bringing at-risk people to within 100 feet of two of our schools is, is um, just a cautionary tale, as always looking out for the safety of our students above everything else. And then item number 17 on the Vivante project, which I'm completely agnostic on, but just on the construction traffic. Um, as we live really close to where that intersection is. Mrs. Kawayoshi, Kawayoshi yeah, yeah. item 17, wrong. yeah, is yeah. yeah. public hearing. Yeah. Okay, That's I thought it was on the consent calendar. <laughs> no, she no. stopped me yeah. Okay, item 16. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sorry. I was looking to see where it is, and <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good evening, City Council and Mayor Dixon. This is, my name is Wendy Weeks, and I'm the Executive Director for Youth Employment Service in Costa Mesa. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of um, item number 14 for the funding, and I just wanted to go ahead and um, say uh, a quick little bit about what Youth Employment Service does and how long we've been in the area, so, um, and um, looking for your consideration for continued funding. Um, we at Youth Employment Service have been around for almost 50 years as of uh, next April, and we're excited to say that we have continued to grow our organization and the number served um, through the, the past uh, five years. And um, excited to also notice that we have continued to also serve um, even though it's still a smaller amount of Newport Beach uh, clients and 16 to 24 year olds, we do continue to grow in that area and also in working with even more of our employers in the area. What our organization does is we help 16 to 24 year olds become employment ready by putting them through workshops and mock interviews so that they can become uh, those that are actual reasonable, uh, responsible uh, employees for our upcoming workforce and really appreciate any funding that you could continue to provide to our little organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comments on the consent calendar? Seeing none, we'll come back. Uh, do we, any council comments? Seeing none, let's have a motion. We have a motion to approve and a second. Who was the original motion? Mr. Herd, Mr. O'Neill, followed by? Councilmember Herdman. Herdman, second. okay, uh, let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, since I was the one who pulled item number 12, the replacement of the outdoor warning system, I'll ask staff to come forward to explain that. I don't know if we have any members of the community who have been watching for this item for a while. There you are, <laughs> Mr. Ozunian. Okay, this is for you. <laughs> uh, we have Katie Ng here, our emergency services manager uh, and uh, would you please explain what we are doing because this is really exciting for our public safety good evening council members and mayor dixon uh, tonight we're uh what we have before you is to discuss the replacement of our outdoor warning system uh, if you remember back to 2010 uh, due to a couple tsunami warnings and uh, 
tsunami events that went on in the city and as well as around the world, uh, the council at that time made the decision to put in an outdoor notification system to alert residents in the low-lying areas of tsunamis or really it could be any type of disaster or emergency. So that was in 2010. Fast forward to now. Uh, last year we did a full test on those outdoor warning sirens and what we discovered, there's three of them, the three sirens are in West Newport, at Marina Park, and at the Wedge. What we discovered during that full power test is that they are not working properly. So what we did is we hired an acoustic specialist to come out to tell us what was going on as far as uh, could residents hear the sirens, what was the distance, that type of thing. We discovered that two of the sirens were not functioning properly, the third uh, was. So what we did was go back to our original vendor, American Signal, had them come out, do an assessment of the sirens and discuss if they could be replaced, upgraded, that type of thing. As you know, in the coastal environment, things tend to rust. So we purchased a system back in 2010 with mechanical parts, um, and those are expensive to replace. And what we found looking around is it was more cost effective and using uh, current technologies and future technologies to look at other vendors. What you have before you tonight is a purchase from the LRAD system, Long Range Acoustic Device Corporation. Um, that is the company that Laguna Beach and several other of our Orange County partners have purchased systems from. And we are, um, have before you to replace the three existing sirens with the LRAD system. Is there any photo to illustrate that? <coughs> no, that's okay. I just didn't know if there was. All right, do we have any questions? No? Um, let me just say thank you for following up on this. Uh, I know this is something that you've been working on for quite some time, and it is important to the peninsula and peninsula residents. So uh, thank you very much. Are there any public comments? Please come forward. Uh, Brian Ozonian, 45-year peninsula resident in Balboa. So for the whole length of time I've lived on Balboa Peninsula, I've never heard the siren at all, at all. If it happened uh, that we had a tsunami, uh, I couldn't hear it, even during the tests. And all the tests that were done, I went all around the property, couldn't hear a thing. This is at e where the boardwalk ends, at E Street and Balboa Boulevard. So my suggestion is not to trust the, the consultant, that you have a provision and however you move, that if it's still deficient, more towers be erected and installed. Because if we don't all hear it, it's not fair. We all have to hear it. So I can't hear the one at Marina Park, I can't hear the one at, uh, at the Wedge. Um, maybe the people in Corona Del Mar can hear it, but I, I can't hear it, never heard it. So the other comment I'll make about the corrosiveness well, gee, <laughs> we live in a corrosive environment. That should have been completely addressed in the beginning of the specifications. So not to go backwards, but looking forward, I just hope that we hear it and how you notify the public through Nixle or this last one was supposed to be a full volume test, if I'm correct. And um, I was hopeful I'd hear one and didn't hear any. So, uh, but maybe because two of them were mouth. Was the West Newport functioning? No, not during the fun oh. fully functional test, it was not. Which one was? At the wedge. Okay, well, I didn't hear it at all, so uh, that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I think we will hear it, and so we <laughs> when, it, when will it be installed and operable? Jonathan, thank you to, to be here also. You're welcome, Mayor Dixon. Uh, so the timeline we've received from the uh, equipment provider, LRAD, is 12 to 16 weeks after they receive the purchase order. And that puts us uh, sometimes start time right after Thanksgiving and finish before Christmas. Very good. All right. Well, thank Madam you. Mayor, if I may, yes. if anyone's in Hilo, go to the tsunami warning system in Hilo. It's in the old bank building. The video is actually in the vault. It is unbelievable how we are in the ring of fire. If you don't know what the ring of fire is, they'll surely explain it. We had one in Indonesia. We got uh, events in Alaska and South America. So that is the ring of fire. And so. I think we're kind of on borrowed time. Well, we're going to have the best technology to keep us informed, so thank you for, for your input. Uh, any other public comments on this item? I'll bring it back up here. Mr. Avery. I assume this, it 
company plans these things out, they know where they can reach, and uh, they've, they've got it figured out? Yes, Mr. Aver, we have sound projections produced by LRAD that uh, show the not only the siren pattern, uh, depending on the tone that we use, but also voice, clear voice uh, okay. technology that they use, so we can use for announcements. We do have that information, and the projections are um, very adequate for our needs for now. And we would have to sign off at the end of this. There'd be a trial. Yes, obviously. Not, not, not only the installation, but we will test them in C2. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. O Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, so the, the two things that gave me pause on this one, the first one was the fact that a tsunami warning device we were using was not compatible with a coastal environment. So I'm glad that we are going to have a tsunami warning device that <laughs> will be compatible with a coastal environment. Um, the second is, have we given thought to testing more often at full blast? I know that it's probably not ideal for our residents by any stretch, but it's a whole lot worse to find out that it doesn't work. Yes, our plan is to test them at full power once a month. Uh, I we, that's we what tested we did them before, didn't we? Haven't we always been doing that? We tested them once a month at, at test power, yeah. uh, and these are mechanical sirens, and they would power up at about 10%. Uh, and then it would report back electronically that the test was successful. In other words, they powered up to 10%. That's why Mr. Ozunia never heard them. They're not meant to be heard. They're meant to just make sure that the impeller would turn and the rotational uh, motor would work. Um, but it, there, that was test mode. So we won't be using test mode anymore. We will test at full power once a month. Very good. Uh, Ms. Brenner. Grace, I had a question. Could this be considered a meeting of our emergency council for FEMA purposes to check it off on the list? Uh, no, that doesn't, but um, we will, uh, we, we do have that schedule to, to come up in this fall. So okay. we'll be back. Any other questions? All right. Um, do we have a motion to approve this item, the replacement of the outdoor warning system? I motion approval. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Avery, second by Mayor Pro Tem. Let's vote. The motion carries unanimously, 7 0. Okay, Madam Clerk. Public comments are invited on non-agenda items generally considered to be within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes. Before speaking, please state your name for the record. Are there any public comments on non-agenda items? Please come forward. Any others? Just come start to line up if there are any. Uh, Mayor Dixon, members of the Council, my name is Jim Mosier. Uh, re regarding your decision to join the uh, the lawsuit or a petition for a lawsuit about uh, the city of Boise matter. I forgot to make this part of my comment earlier <clears throat> because you were in a hurry and very late. Um, but I was trying to look on our city website because I am sure we had engaged Mr. Ted Olson before in some kind of legal work. And I noticed that the contracts, many contracts that the city signs for outside legal services do not seem to be in the city clerk's um, database. And I think that's an oversight because our charter requires all contracts to be there. It makes no exception for legal work. The public should know who we contract with. And I think that could be easily corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Members of the council, Mayor Dixon, my name is Arthur Peskin. I'm a lifelong resident of Newport Beach. I graduated from Corona Del Mar High School as a member of the Youth Council, and I love this city. People want to live, work, and play in Newport Beach. But why? It's something more profound than just our beautiful beaches, great people, great shopping and culture. People want to live the Newport lifestyle. And we should all be very proud of that fact in this room today because based on the hard work, day in and day out, of not only all of you sitting up there right now, but everyone in this room. However, with that success comes immense challenges. And first and foremost is the continued growth of this city. Businesses, companies, corporations want to relocate to Newport Beach. People want to continue to move here, and tourists want to continue to visit our city. It is up to us to ensure that we grow responsibly. And my associates and I, have two words for you as a solution. Mono, rail. 
Newport Beach has an opportunity here to embrace the 21st century with one of the pinnacles of 21st century public transit technology. Now, I commend the city council for, and the city for their actions in creating the Baboa Peninsula trolley, a form of public transit that is free and that allows tourists and residents of Newport to enjoy the, the coastal areas of our city. But that simply isn't enough. The city suffers from a congestion problem. Residents can't even get down to the peninsula or anywhere near the harbor on a weekend, especially during the summer. And the problem is only going to continue to get worse. But why is a monorail the solution? Let me explain. A monorail is a clean, efficient, and quiet system for public transit. It can be built using existing medians on major thoroughfares, and it minimizes any risk of eminent domain in the city. We propose a five-line, 47-station plan for a monorail in the city of Newport Beach, connecting neighborhoods as diverse as Newport Coast, Balboa Island, Westcliff, Newport North, and Fashion Island, with a central station centered right here at the Civic Center. It would have weekday operating hours from 6 a.m. to midnight in order to ensure that those that work in Newport Beach can get around. And on the weekends, it would be extended to 2 a.m. to make sure that people can enjoy the nightlife and culture of this city in a safe and responsible manner that doesn't uh, force them to drive cars and risk the risk of, uh, of driving drunk, which I think we'd all agree is a major problem in this city. Now, we are asking you to really embrace a dynamic, ground-changing, ground-breaking idea for the city of Newport Beach. And I ask you to seriously consider this to make Newport Beach a beacon of the 21st century in the United States of America. Thank you. Thank At you. this time, I would like to pass out pamphlets that we've provided with information. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Do we have any other public comments on non-agenda items? Please come forward. Seeing none. All right, let's get to business here. Public hearing, the first item, number 15, the Mesa Drive townhomes call for review. And uh, we will be considering a resolution of, uh, to uphold the Planning Commission's approval of major site development for this eight unit residential condominium project located at 1501 Mesa Drive and to 2462 Santa Ana Avenue. So, Mr. Jurgis, you'd like to tell us what's going on. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council members. Simone Jurgis, I'm your Community Development Director. With me, I have Jim Campbell, who's our Deputy Director, and Liz Westmoreland, who is our Associate Planner. The item um, for this evening is an eight-unit <coughs> townhome project located at 1501 Mesa Drive and, and um, off Santa Ana Avenue. Th this application was presented to the Planning Commission back in April. Um, and the Planning Commission did approve the um, application. There were some community members that had some questions or concerns about compatibility and traffic. Um, Mayor Dixon, you, you've uh, asked for a call for review for the item. We believe that we have a presentation that will answer the co compatibility issues and the traffic issues. So we have a short presentation for you, about, about 10 slides that we'd like to go through. Okay, please proceed, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor. City Council members, I'm Liz Westmoreland with the Planning Division. This application is a call for review, for review for a project that was approved by the Planning Commission back in March of this year. The project includes demolition of two existing single-family residences and the construction of eight new condominium units. A site development review is required to implement the approved tentative tract map. The project is located in the West Santa Ana Heights area at the corner of Santa Ana Avenue and Mesa Drive. It's bordered by the city of Costa Mesa, the county of Orange, or the Santa Ana Country Club, as well as the Santa Ana Heights Specific Plan multifamily area. To provide a brief overview of the layout, there is one central driveway that goes between the two buildings for the project. Each building contains four dwelling units, each containing a two-car garage. There are four guest parking spaces at the rear, as well as areas to turn around. The project complies with all development standards, and no deviations are being requested. This rendering provides a view from Mesa Drive, which is the main or the longest frontage for the project. The applicant has provided substantial architectural treatment as well as building articulation and will utilize high quality durable materials. As you can see, the first floor is actually set down below the existing grade of the sidewalk. So although the project contains four stories, 
it does meet the maximum height limitation of 33 feet for the RMD zone. This view of the project is from Santa Ana Avenue. You can see the driveway that leads to the site from Santa Ana Avenue. The applicant has provided additional setbacks for the top story there on the interior and the exterior to provide some additional visual relief. This is not required by code, but the applicant has provided it. Additionally, the project will be set back 20 feet from the street or the front property line. And all existing hedges, walls, et cetera, that currently impede visibility at the intersection will be removed. Additionally, there are currently three driveways located on the site to access the site, and these would be consolidated into one. They would allow all vehicles to enter and exit the site facing forward, where currently individuals actually have to back out onto the street in order to leave the site. There were a few concerns that came up as part of the previous project review. These related mainly to traffic and intersection concerns, density concerns that were more recently brought up, and neighborhood compatibility. First, in terms of traffic and intersection concerns, this project would result in a net increase of six dwelling units, which equates to about 40 additional vehicle trips a day. This is negligible compared to the roadway. No traffic study would be required by the city of Newport Beach, and no traffic study would be required by city of the Costa Mesa as well. In order to understand the conditions at this intersection and to make sure there weren't any issues we needed to be aware of, we did reach out to the County of Orange because it's their intersection, it's actually their jurisdiction over the signal, and we also reached out to the city of Costa Mesa. They did not report any concerns related to the intersection, and our traffic engineers are comfortable with this project. In terms of compatibility, this project is going to look different from the existing single family development that's located in the city of Costa Mesa. However, there are scattered multifamily developments within the county area as well as the city of Costa Mesa. Further, this type of project is consistent with the development within the RMD zoned block, which goes from about Mesa Drive almost to Orchard Avenue along the Santa Ana Country Club border. Further, the Santa Ana Heights specific plan, which is adjacent to this site, actually allows for more dense development than the applicant is proposing and taller buildings as well. <coughs> Additionally, the applicant is only proposing about 62% of the allowed density for the site. Lastly, the Santa Ana Cottages project, which was approved a couple years ago and is currently under construction, contains three stories and reaches the same maximum height as the proposed project, and it's located directly adjacent to the site. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, it's Jim Campbell, Deputy Director. I wanted to go over a little bit of the density questions. Um, recently, we had a code amendment to kind of change the meaning of this particular zone because there was an inadvertent error in the zoning code, and we took care of that last month. There were some comments that were raised there about the density of this particular zone, so I want to step you through that. Um, the area was pre-zoned in 2004, and at that time, we established a zoning density designator for the site that was reflective of the existing density on the ground. What we discovered is that the density in this area, this RMD 1000, uh, actually was higher than what the county's general plan afforded, and what we wanted to do was to avoid creating nonconformities, and so we created a, a more dense zone in this area at 43 dwelling units per acre. Um, and the area was annexed in, in 2008, um, and we did some uh, code changes, and we created one RMD zone for that entire area. That map that you see there is really a kind of an excerpt of the county zoning pattern, which allowed for two different density designations, the 1,000 square foot per uh, dwelling unit and the 3,000 square foot per dwelling unit. What we ended up doing is creating one cohesive zone for the RM area, and that's just really north of uh, Mesa Drive there along Santa Ana. The area southerly to that, we haven't annexed yet, and so that area is, is an area that we might consider annexing in the future. So again, I wanted to emphasize that the density that was reflected in the current general plan and these actions from 2004 and 7, it reflected the existing development and avoided creating nonconformities. Can I just ask a quick question? Certainly. Is it are, are our density standards more dense than the counties were in this particular in this specific area? At the end of the day, it did make it more dense than the county's planning documents, but it, we did that purposefully to actually reflect the existing density on the ground. We didn't want to create non-conforming residential density. So we had it. We were denser than the county. Yes, we created it denser by design. Or more dense. Okay. Um, and so uh, again, these these density designations were created uh, over a decade ago. Uh, the project does comply with the general plan and the zoning standards that we have in effect today. And so I want to kind of step you through the history of that because the question came up and. 
Um, the, the history is a little bit interesting, but again, it was done by design. So okay. with that, we'll move on to the conclusion of the, there, thank you, Liz. Uh, so what we'd like you to do is conduct a public hearing tonight. Um, and we do want you to find the project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, a class 32 for infill development. This is for projects that are consistent with the general plan, consistent with all applicable standards. We'd like you to approve the major site development review. Again, this is the action that the Planning Commission took. And this is a de novo public hearing, so you're not bound by the Planning Commission's actions. But again, we, we do recommend that taking that action this evening. And Liz uh, and I are, and Simone are here to answer any questions that you might have. I have one question that Liz brought up the term, and I do hear this a lot in our planning documents and project planning, that the project would, we require, the city requires high quality materials. Do we ever specify anything more than that in our code requirements? Uh, How Mayor, do we define high quality? I don't, <coughs> it's subjective. It is. And we do have a materials board for this project. So we brought it with us if you'd like to see that. Um, and we usually typically pass that materials board to the planning commission. And the planning commissioners have a chance to actually look at the materials board, the colors, the materials. It is subjective. And the planning commission saw that board? Yes. Okay. All right. Are there, uh, Mr. Avery? Actually, if I could just jump in just real quick, I wanted to uh, make sure that everyone knew that uh, Councilmember Duffield had recused himself uh, based on real property interests. He's a member of the Santa Ana uh, Country Club, and that's why he left the room. Okay. Mr. Avery. Did planning anticipate um, uh, builders to go down half a floor to achieve the, the uh, number of floors? I wouldn't say we anticipate it, but it's a common practice. Um, mm -hmm. our, our height measurements are done from the existing grade, and so if you want to dig down and create retaining structures, it's typically done on a sloping property. We don't see it too often on a flat property, but it is consistent with the code. The overall height of the buildings will still be the 33 feet from the existing grade. So it, if they didn't dig down and they built it right at grade, the building would still be as tall as, as you see on the, the, the diagrams. Right. So... Um, there's going to be a number, these are just going to increase in that zone, right? That, that's correct. There will be probably we're encouraging that, that that's clearly correct. with the density situation here. And I think that's a good thing. Obviously, we need, I uh, assume this is, if not affordable housing, uh, compared to the rest of the housing in Newport, it's going to be more reasonable. Yeah, and, yes, it's not coastal property, so it'll be cheaper than coastal property. Well, right. yeah, and just the, the, the density <laughs> side of it. Yes, that's correct. It's, so it's, it's all tied attached, together. Attached housing. And as, the, as, they, as you go down that row and it all infills, how does it impact the neighbors that are uh, on the property line to the east? Okay, so the Santa Ana Heights specific plan borders this zone um, to the right on this map here. And it actually allows for denser development than what is proposed by this project and for higher uh, buildings than this proposed project. It allows up to 35 feet. So that single, there's a uh, single family uh, residential area behind this, some of this, des this designated zoning area, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, what will happen with that eventually? It will all go multi-residential? It's possible, but potentially unlikely just because the size of the lots that are there, right. like they won't be able to accommodate right. anymore. Right. So in the future, they can expect to have <clears throat> large, you know, a wall behind them, basically, I would assume. That's true, minus mm -hmm. the setbacks. There's a 25-foot right. setback along right. the back. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think <clears throat> it's, it sounds great. So I'm just trying to think of the impacts. And I'm sure planning must have seen impacts like that. And also any impacts to building down. So what's that require, a pump system and all that to keep the water out? That, that's correct, because you're, you're, you're depressing the structure downwards, right. and you know, it's basically creating a bathtub. You're gonna have to pump all that, all that water out when it rains. And the, the, the Planning Commission did have a lot of questions with regards to the height um, and de depressing the structure down and trying to understand how we're measuring grade. You know, th this project meets our zoning code. But it is four stories. Four stories is allowed, but and as long as it meets the height, and it does meet the height, right? So because you're depressing it. Yeah, and that, that was my interest. Is just any unintended consequences of building in this fashion, which, you know, to most people, that's something you don't do, right? You don't <laughs> you don't create a bathtub and put your home in it. You know? <laughs> so, thank you, uh, Miss Brenner. 
Um, I need to disclose ex parte communication here because I did go visit with the applicants at their site and um, nice young couple, almost three in their family now. And um, I had been supportive of Mayor Dixon pulling this for review. My concerns at the time were the congestion on the intersection and the visibility as far as people getting in and out and that sort of thing. What I came to find out through my um, visiting with the applicants was that the parking that is on Mesa Drive, where it is, you pull in currently, you have to back out onto Mesa Drive to get out of that. That will be eliminated, so that will be safer. And the one driveway that they're creating, you will, the people will be able to pull in and turn around so that they will be coming out face forward onto Santa Ana Avenue, which will be also an improvement. And the other thing that I was very interested in was how they have set back everything from the corner. So it turns out the visibility on that corner is going to be best on their corner of all the four corners in that area. And um, I was actually pretty appalled at the fact that the other three corners have either built up to the very edge tall fences or tall shrubs and um, you really can't see from any of the other three corners when you're making turns or coming out into that intersection. So once I was there and saw that this was actually an improvement to the safety of the area, then I was, um, I was supportive of this project. Um, I, as long as you have this image up, I just want to ask a couple questions. While it is within the height limit, obviously 33 feet, uh, this fourth story structure, uh, I'm sure it, you said it's according to our code. Uh, but as you know, we will be discussing third story structures in the next, is it this week or next week in a community meeting? And so I, w I would like to better understand because this fourth floor structure is set, looks like it's properly set back, but it is four walls instead of open walls, two walls. I thought the code required two open walls. Uh, in this particular case, it, it really doesn't. Uh, you can have fully enclosed space at this at this elevation. Um, there isn't any additional step back in this particular zone. I th think what you're referring to is is how the single families and the duplexes in the R1, R2 zone have step additional setbacks on the third level, and that's what we're going to be discussing at the community but meeting. But not on week. RM. But not on the RM. Oh. And so, so this additional step back that you're seeing here on that upper level, the applicant is doing that by design. They're actually going to be creating some outdoor living space up there for the residents' enjoyment. Um, and I think that, the, that, that offset in the design actually helps the overall architecture and helps reduce the building mass on the adjacent properties. And, and we feel that's a, a, a good design for, for the area. Okay, oh, Mr. Avery. Yeah, I, um, overall, I, I think the project's a, a good one because I think this represents the future. This is what's going to be happening. We're going to have, we're just, we're going vertical and uh, this is a way to do it and stay within our our guidelines and within our height limits but uh, yeah it's unique but and it also is providing some serious uh, you know providing housing it's great thank you just to be clear we do not the city in our code does not have design guidelines correct um, our codes don't have very strong design guidelines there they basically look to uh, make sure we don't have long on our unarticulated walls we like varying roof planes but they're very subjective standards um, you know, staff and the Planning Commission looked at this. We feel that this project does meet uh, the limited uh, guidelines that we have, but we don't have a formal design review process. This site development review application is what we have. Okay. Let's turn it out to the public. Any public comments, please come forward. Tim Stokes. Um, as former chairman of the Santa Ana Heights Project Advisory Committee, um, one of the agreements in the annexation agreement is that any of those changes had to go back to the county to get approved. One thing I didn't hear tonight is that this project's gone back to the county because you did a change. And let me give you an example. When we built the fire station, we had the training center. The training center was too tall for the zoning there. It had to go back to the county for for. for uh, an approval. The reason why that was put in the annexation agreement is because the residents didn't really want to annex into Newport Beach because they didn't trust, you know, the whole transparency issue from that perspective. So 
what we agreed to when we annexed into the city was that clause. You can't get rid of the horse trails, you can't get rid of the kennels, you can't get rid of the, the acre property, half acre properties, three acre properties with this type of project. That was the reason we put that in the annexation agreement. So I didn't hear Mr. Campbell say that he went back to the county to get that approved. That's clearly in the annexation agreement with Santa Ana Heights. It was under policy K-6, but the policy K-6 got eliminated somehow, and, I, we, and we can't find that. So that, but it's still in the annexation agreement that any of these changes has to go back to the county to get approved. Thank you. Um, Mr. Campbell, do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, uh, Mayor Dixon. The, what, what Mr. Stokes is referring to is a pre-annexation agreement that was done between the county um, and the city before we annexed the area. It's my understanding and is that that only really applies to the Santa Ana Heights specific area plan, which is a little bit, which, which was part of the same annexation. Um, and I'm, I'm very familiar with that provision and that we do have to go to the county if we want to change the specific plan. This particular uh, RMD zoned area is actually not part of the specific plan. It was just some residual zoning on the periphery of it. And it's my understanding we don't need to go to the county to make any changes to the regulations here. Again, tonight we're not changing any regulations here. Uh, we're just looking at a project that would be consistent with those parameters. Okay. Um, oh, Mr. Mosier, all right. I was, are you the applicant? No? Is the applicant here this evening? Would you mind just letting him speak for a moment, Mr. Mosier, and you can come back. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I'm the applicant for the project. I currently live at 1501 Mesa Drive, and uh, prior to that, I lived at 20462 Santa Ana. And um, my original uh, uh, plans were just to do four units, but my the project next door ended up getting approved and my neighbor to that left me uh, wanted to sell me her property. So I, I had to start the process over again and uh, go through, you know, the planning Could commission. you just identify your name? Oh, uh, my name is Anastasios Nikola. Yeah. So I went back to the process of getting uh, approved through the planning commission or through the uh, uh, city planners. And I just basically asked them, what can I build? What are the standards? Um, and on top of that, I looked at the, uh, uh, the traffic and how all the neighbors basically built up tall hedges. One of my neighbors has like an unpermitted fence and I really, I'm planning on living at the property. So I set it back even further and tried providing f more visibility to the area, um, to vehicles and pedestrians coming into that intersection. Um, with regards to the, uh, uh, the subterranean, there, we had to get a WQMP plan, which so I have permeable pavers in the center of the uh, driveway. So when it does rain, water seeps directly down into the concrete, and then there's like three backup systems. There's a sump pump, and then there's an overflow, and it's the best way to kind of treat water, putting it back right into our ground. The, uh, the, the top floor, the roof deck, the code doesn't really require any type of open space. Or I think it's limited maybe... Uh, I think 188 square feet, and I'm providing like 10 times that amount because I think outdoor living space is um, a key point to someone wanting to purchase the home and their family. So, you know, as opposed to just having that whole floor uh, additional living space, um, I set it back 15 feet on one side and 10 feet on the other so people could enjoy the, enjoy the outdoor uh, uh, space. Um, there wasn't an unfortunate accident in the area. Uh, there was a, a D, uh, someone that was leaving the Godel Tavern and they were, uh, they got arrested for a felony DUI and I was the first person that kind of responded to the area. Uh, and there was a, a bad accident, you know, and uh, one of the main things that I wanted to do was just provide better visibility because of that happened. So I'm trying to build the, the best home that I can because I'm gonna be living there. Um, and also wanna make it safe for the area. The, with regards to the building materials, I'm using the same interior designer uh, that the Lido House Villas were created by. So the, as opposed to using like a textured stucco, I'm gonna have a smooth stucco, um, which costs a little bit more money, but has a better overall look. Um, fiber cement sidings, you know, in the front, stone, uh, board and battens. So I'm trying to encompass a lot of the uh, newer developed homes that are in the coastal area, but further away from it, so I'm trying to use the best materials because, like I said, I'm going to be living there as well. I'm not just going to build a home, uh, this project, and sell it off. 
But um, yeah. with regards to the, the amount of units, I could have installed more units, but I wanted to build a better quality project. So I originally scaled it back. I had from 13 to nine to eight. So, um, you know, it conforms to all the homes down the Santa Ana corridor. All the majority of those homes have uh, a center driveway and two, you know, uh, large uh, townhome complexes on each side. Uh, my neighbor's house is doing the same exact thing. And if you drive down that street, that's where a lot of, you know, that's the Santa Ana Heights area. So I'm just conforming to the area that I'm in. And, and I went back and I worked with the city to, you know, find all the setbacks and requirements. And that's what, you know, I developed. Okay. Anything, anything else you want to add? Thank you. No, I think that's it. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Yep. All right. Any other public comments? Mr. Mosier. Mayor Dixon, members of the council, <clears throat> my name is Jim Mosier. At, at the study session this afternoon, <clears throat> council member Brenner said that people make mistakes. People do. I make a lot of mistakes. Our staff makes mistakes. It's difficult to admit when you make a mistake. And sometimes instead of admitting that, you kind of create a fiction of that you did something intentionally when you really didn't. Uh, with all due respect, I think our staff is creating a fiction here about the density issue. I'm a little surprised they showed their slide 10, which is <clears throat> what the council thought the zoning was going to be in this area, because if you look closely at that, you will see that the brown or tan area extends north of Mesa Drive, <clears throat> and the county's intention was that that area and the city accepted that, uh, be 3,000 square feet per dwelling unit, which is indeed what is called medium density. <clears throat> and the higher density, requiring just 1,000 square feet per unit, was not supposed to start at the corner. It was supposed to start several lots in. <clears throat> and that, that is the 43 dwelling units per acre, which is by no means medium density, that is high density. In their staff report, they show some other maps where the brown sort of disappeared. <clears throat> and they said kind of the staff intended to do this. The staff doesn't make zoning decisions. The city council makes zoning decisions. This is what the city council was shown. And as you know, the city council has to rely on what they're told this is tonight's agenda packet. You have a 1,000 pages. You don't read everything, so you rely on what you're being told. And the city, was, city council was continuously and systematically told that this was just translating the county's zoning into our system. I am sure the council was never told, hey, do you want to change these for six lots, seven, I think, lots there from medium density to high density? And as further proof of that, I mean, we screwed up. We called it RMD detached. And we said, no, it's not detached. It's supposed to be RMD, standing for medium density. But medium density is the 3,000. It's the tan area. And so now we're overriding. We're saying it's medium density, but it's all overridden with this 1,000, which is a high density number, small lot area per thing. So. Uh, you can believe the fiction if you want, but it's a fiction. And the council, I do not believe, ever knew that they were intentionally changing the density here. Whether that needs to go to the county or not, I don't know, but I don't think the, it was intentional. And like Councilman Avery, I was concerned when this was before the Planning Commission about this concept of building a bathtub so you can squeeze in a fourth story. But I additionally have a concern about this kind of construction. Is it really fire safe? If you're up on that fourth floor, you have a narrow little stairway, three flights you have to go down if there's some kind of a fire on the first floor. Is this really what we want in Newport Beach? Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? This is Mayor, Council Members. I'm Berkeley Agonis. I live on the southwest corner of this intersection. Um, I've lived there since the fall of 2014. Um, an immediate response, Ms. Brenner, on your comment about fencing and stuff. We, 
we acquired the house with the fence as it is. It's according to code on San, uh, Costa Mesa that was approved. Good thing is we worked with the city for the last two years to get a sidewalk project. We're gonna connect the sidewalks all around the corner so that construction starts on Monday. Um, so that's how fast after two years that's coming together. So that will clean up the space. Um, fences will be moved back, trees will be removed um, to making it safe. Our, I'm the individual that has brought up multiple times the safety concerns and the traffic issues that have gone on in this intersection. Um, going into this, the in the city planning meeting, the discussion was four accidents uh, reported by the city of Costa Mesa. That is incorrect. It's actually 10. One on January 31st, 2015, April 4th, 2015, June 7th, 2015, October 15th, 2015, March 22nd, 2016, April 13th, 2016, May 25th, 2016, September 9th, 2017, September 6th, 26, 2017, and May 1st was the tragedy um, in, the er in the early evening. Those are all reported. I can give you the incident numbers, but I'll spare you those details right now. Um, all these accidents are a result of running the intersection. Speed, we have three speed zones that are going through. You come south from Bristol, it's a 45. Going up a hill to a blind intersection. Mesa is 35 miles an hour, and as, me, as soon as you cross that intersection, it's a hard 30 at my driveway. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, our issue with this property is you're adding 40 ins and outs every time into that intersection, which was three entry points in the intersection, now is one with an illegal left turn. That if you try to leave this property, you have to go over a double yellow into a left turn lane to go into that intersection. So very, very concerned about people moving in, vans coming in there who cannot get down that street between the two buildings, it's physically impossible. No fire trucks, you can't get down that to, if there were an issue into the current design of the process. That was discussed at the city planning meeting. Um, and having that higher density of traffic that are coming in and out into an illegal left turn is gonna create issues. If you come south from Bristol, you go up a hill, you cannot see the driveway where you're going into this situation. So if somebody's making a left turn, it's a physical impossibility to see that. Um, the issues are twofold speed and then traffic lights. We need to go back to stop signs into this intersection. I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. My neighbors are all with you on this situation. Our, and it, so it's a four way hard stop, which you have at University and Santa Ana now. And you can pull the report on the traffics on those as well, because that's the same situation, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, or in count, you know, the county in the middle, um, significantly less in going into it. We have to do something about this. Um, we're going, we're adding more people to that, which is fine, but we just have to figure out the speed at which is happening. Um, we're recommending another entry into this process, into this location to allow a safe turn allow people to enter exit of this property. There should be another one on Mesa. I'm looking at that so that you can safely come in and out of this. Me as a neighbor can see people coming in and out of it um, and we don't have the issues. We're making financial contributions of tens of thousands of dollars and making these improvements with the city of Costa Mesa to ours to improve the visibility in this intersection coming into this conversation. And we just, we're not saying don't build. We're not saying to, don't do a project we have to figure out the speed and the safety situation in this because there will be another death. There will be another situation because of the speed. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> um, you may be seated. Okay. Uh, do you want to address Mr. Campbell or Mr. Georges the traffic inf accident information he just disclosed? Was that not in the records that the planning commissioner or the planning department looked at? You know, we, we had um, City of Costa Mesa sent their traffic um, summary collision summary report. So we have the document. It's in your attachments as attachment I. It's the same document that we provided to the Planning Commission. So the only thing I could rely upon is the, the report that City of Costa Mesa provided us. And how, how many accidents? Is just that one? No, it, it looks like it is... There were four I heard accidents. one. I'm sorry. Maybe I just there, misheard. There was four accidents on the report. Four, and and this gentleman reported ten. 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 What would? How would we explain that discrepancy? Mm -hmm. We can't. We have to. We have to reach back out to the City of Costa Mesa huh? again. We did already, and they provided the report. So. Okay, Miss um, Brenner. I had the I had the same question about why is there a signal in this residential area, and can that be eliminated? Because 
that looks like the problem, that people are accelerating to make the green light instead of slowing down for a stop sign. And I had the same question about why there was a, a signal in this residential area. Do we know or what the process would be to get rid of it? We'll have a uh, public works director, Dave Webb. He's going to take a crack at that, that question there. Yeah, excuse me. I, I don't know the history of this signal. I'm guessing it met warrants at the time. Sounds like it used to be a stop sign and then they probably upgraded it. Uh, I believe the north-south street is a much more, um, well, they're both pretty busy streets. So maybe there's a history that drove the signal here. I, I can, I apologize. I don't even know if that's our signal. It could be the county or it could be Costa Mesa's. Yeah. So it's the county it's signal. It's a county. Stop. That's correct. It was a four-way stop and they put this in. It was a four-way stop. It's a county intersection. And so they would have to be the ones that would That's make correct. a change. They probably looked at the warrant counts. You know, if it was a four-way stop, they looked at the warrants, and it warranted an intersection, uh, streetlights. Mr. Hmm. Avery, um, cannot one of our fire engines get down the center of that? No, they would not be able to access through the center of it. However, I guess that's not an issue. Yeah, fire has reviewed it, and they're comfortable with it. Uh huh. And then. Um, I'm sorry, um, Councilmember Avery, you're talking about the center of the, between the two yes. buildings? Right, no, they won't, they won't access it. They would stage on the street. Uh-huh. And then um, I wonder if the uh, another exit was explored, you know, to give someone an opportunity to leave the premises and make so, a So the building turn. would, the, the structures will be fire sprinklered. The, they'll have the proper um, smoke detection system. Oh, yeah. No, I'm talking about just the another... Driveway? Driveway, yeah. I, I, you know, from, from I don't mean to, th it, it, I'm sure it probably screws up the, you know, circulation. the, the guest parking right. and right. all that, but it just seems to me it's, it'd be nice for the tenants, or the, the owners or whatever, to be, have an option to, to leaving, take a little pressure off the, uh, the intersection. Um, I didn't close the public hearing. Are there any more public comments? My name is Chris White, and good evening, Mayor Dixon, members of the council. Uh, I'm in favor of this project. I'm currently a resident up at the Avenue of the Arts Apartments in the city of Costa Mesa, and I'd love to live in Newport Beach, and this is the type of pro uh, condominium I'm looking for. Uh, I work on Pullman, right near Baker Street. I come down Red Hill daily. And I go through this intersection daily. You know, Red Hill turns into Santa Ana. Um, I'm really familiar with the area. I'd love to live in the project. Uh, I think the architecture is fantastic. And I think it's, uh, I, th I agree with uh, Mr. Avery. I think this is kind of the future, and this is something I want to live in. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please come forward. Good evening, Mayor Dixon and City Council members. Uh, my name is Jamie Nicolau. I'm the spouse of Anastasios Nicolau, and I am in favor of this project. Um, <laughs> not only is this project uh, going to be a home for our growing family, but it's a good quality uh, project for other community members in the Newport Beach area that would obviously find these homes, you know, favorable to live in the area, as it is a very preferable area for us as well. well thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing, bring it back up here. All right. Uh, do we have any other comments? Do we have a, oh, Mr. O'Neill? I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Okay. Any other comments? Let's vote. With Council Member Duffield voting or recusing himself and Council Member Muldoon voting no, the motion carries four, one, five, one, sorry. All right, next item number 16 is the consideration of entitlements for Viv Vivanti Senior Housing located at 850-856 San Clemente Drive, formerly known as the Museum House area. Uh, let's hear from staff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Th this is an assisted living facility that's located at 850 San Clemente Drive. Um, this is the Orange County Museum of Art um, project site. 
And if the, um, the community remembers, this is the Museum House project site. This is not the Museum House project. It's a completely different project. Um, it's assisted living. Um, we feel really a great project for this area. Um, for the city council, it's their consideration. To, this is really a general plan amendment. We're going to change the zoning for this property to allow this type of uh, residential development for assisted living. So it's going to be for your consideration that the, the, the applications are considered and uh, possibly approved. We do have a development agreement as part of this. We do have a short presentation. Um, Jim, our Deputy Director Jim Campbell is going to go ahead and, and jump right straight into that presentation. The applicant is here. They'll have a short presentation too afterwards. Okay, very good. Please proceed. Uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, um, you know, we're pleased to bring this project forward to you. I, I want to commend Makananova for her uh, work on this project to bring it forward to you today. We've been working on it for quite a while. Uh, as, as Simone indicated, this is a general plan amendment, so we're taking the general plan from private institutional for the former Orange County Museum of Art site and turning it to mixed use. That general plan amendment also includes um, um, adding uh, residential units to that. So this is the project site on uh, San Clemente and the surrounding areas. We have a parking structure. We have the villas at Fashion uh, Island. Uh, the project site's outlined in red. Villas Fashion Island, Fire Station 3. We've got some office uses and parking structures. The Colony um, and Pacific Life is across the street. I want to stop on this slide here. We have existing access that comes in further to the south uh, near the office building closer to, uh, to the west, um, to the south. And there's going to be a central driveway that's created and access is going to be changed. So we'll have a central driveway here. So this is the site plan. Uh, so the building is highlighted right in the middle there moment, momentarily. There it is. So it is a six-story building. We'll have 90 units and 27 beds for a memory care facility. Uh, so we have uh, outdoor living space or outdoor entertainment space for the residents. Uh, we also have parking areas as well. And again, that's, there's a central driveway that would be created on San Clemente. Um, so moving forward, we've got a general plan as noted. Uh, we're going from private institutional to uh, mixed use horizontal. Um, we're also going to be decreasing the residential development limit from 45,000 square feet to 16,000. Again, adding the 90 units. We've done, the, we've done the Charter 423 analysis, uh, which is the green light analysis to see if a vote of the electorate would be required, and it doesn't pass those thresholds, so no vote of the electorate is, is required. The general plan has an implementation program that we do fiscal analysis for large general plan amendments, um, and so we did that. The uh, analysis is based on average uh, costs for different land uses, but in, in, on average, it, this project will support itself from the revenues that we would receive. Um, I think principally that is because the existing use doesn't have any property taxes as an example of land use. So we're also changing the zoning to reflect this particular project. It would uh, create a single-use zone for a residential care facility for the elderly. There is a small height increase from 65 feet to 79 feet. And we feel that's compatible with the area around it. And the Planning Commission reviewed this and did concur as well and offers a recommendation for approval. So again, we've got the mixed-use horizontal. It's kind of a beige salmon color there and, and the private institutional. So that anomaly is going to be changed to reflect the 90 additional units and the reduction of non-residential square footage. And that's the nature of the amendment itself to facilitate, again, this particular project. Um, there are several companion applications with this, a major site development review, which is really the, the overall architecture and layout of the, of the site. The conditional use permit is for that uh, regi residential care facility for the elderly and also alcohol service. There will be a restaurant here with full alcohol service. Again, that's principally for the residents and their guests. Uh, development agreement is also required for this area, um, being as it's a general plan amendment in Fashion Island, or excuse me, the Newport Center area. It does have a 10-year term, one construction phase. Uh, we are in agreement. It does uh, include the payment of a public benefit fee. Uh, $35,000 per unit or total is uh, $3.15 million. It's also a lot merger as well to consolidate the site into one cohesive development site. So all of those fa uh, findings are in the resolutions that are before you this evening. Um, you know, we feel the project serves an aging population, which um, as we all know, it's a significant component of our community. Um, you know, the, we do believe that the land use and the structure is compatible with the area surrounding and, and, and we do have some taller buildings in the area. This is only uh, 79 feet in, in height and so it's similar in height to the area around it. We've done an environmental analysis. It con conducts, uh, consists of an EIR addendum. So we are using the museum house EIR that was prepared several years ago and as you may recall that project was rescinded. 
uh, but the EIR still was certified. So we used that uh, analysis and uh, we did evaluate at the changes project circumstances um, and there are no additional impacts that would warrant additional environmental review and that's the, the purpose of that analysis. Uh, we do have one uh, uh, significant environmental effect and that's construction related noise and I'll add that you know, this project actually takes less than Museum House would have taken in terms of time so the impact actually is less than it would otherwise be as it relates to the analysis done for Museum House. So we do uh, want the council to adopt uh, the, and certify that EIR addendum, and that's one of the actions that you have uh, before you in the first resolution. Uh, we also want to adopt the uh, findings of fact and a statement of overriding considerations for that environmental review. And again, this is where we're saying that the project benefits outweigh that short-term construction-related noise impact. Um, so we want you to conduct a public hearing. We want you to adopt the resolutions um, and ordinances that you have before you in your packet. Again, to certify the EIR addendum, approve the project. And those ordinances will be passed on to second reading at the next meeting. Uh, McConnell, Nova, and I, and, uh, and Ms. Mojers, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. All right, did you have a question here, Mr. Oh, yeah, your name's still there. Uh, Mr. Avery. When do I move in? <laughs> 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 I think there's gonna be some locals going there. What a great project. It's really something and uh, it's a long way from where we were a few years ago on this. I think it's a, a real win. So thank you. Any other comments up here before we put it out to the public? Any member, we have the applicant here. Would you like to speak? Please come forward. Absolutely. Mayor, uh, fellow City Council members, my name is Corey Alder. I'm president of Nexus Development. Got Kurt Olson here, who's the founder and CEO. Kurt has lived here since 1967. Uh, I've been here since 1972. We both went to Corona Del Mar High School. Uh, I can tell you uh, that we are extremely proud of what we've done here at Vivante. Um, we opened our first Vivante in Costa Mesa. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, we opened in October of 2013. Uh, we had owned the land for a long time, and we saw a need to take care of the seniors of our community. Uh, we were met with a lot of skepticism in the industry, and we ignored it. And we said, we, we think we know what the residents of Newport Beach and Costa Mesa really need. Uh, there's a giant need for it. And we set out to be the best senior housing project in the Western United States, and, and we have accomplished that. Um, a lot of hard work, a lot of dedicated people, um, but not only did we create the best building, the best amenities, and, and created something very special for residents, but we hired people to take care of our seniors. And uh, as, as our population ages, uh, many things start to happen in their life that, um, instability that comes into their life and we try to bring some stability to their life some 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 love some fun and uh, I can tell you anybody who's been there um, it's a fun place to be it's quality it's fun and that's our commitment we live here we know most of the people that are are in the community because they're our friends parents uh, our grandparents, and so that's been our commitment from the very beginning. And everything we do in that project centers around what's best for the residents. We don't look at our financial statements first. We don't look at expenses. We don't do any of that. We look at how do we make them happy. If we can do that, their families will be happy. We will get what we want at the end of the day. So when this opportunity came up here in Newport Center, very, very excited. Uh, we, we immediately approached the public. We, we set out to uh, be a community within a community, and we reached out to lots of folks, the Irvine Company, other community members, and, and shared our vision. We've stayed exactly with that vision, and, and we're proud of what we have before you here tonight. Um, this is an upgrade from our first Vivante. Uh, I can tell you, uh, Kurt is very adept at, at design and layout of projects, and um, this is unequaled in the country. So um, we are still 
committed to the vision of taking care of the seniors of our community. And um, we've got tons of great things that we're doing. Um, we build a concrete building. We build all the units adaptable so no senior ever has to move. They can come to our community. We stop the instability. We bring stability to them. We give them fitness. We give them exercise. We give them entertainment. We spend way more on entertainment and food than anybody in the industry. We've got the coolest bowling alley, arcade, fun center, and that's meant to bring all the family members, all the generations together. So we celebrate our seniors, we celebrate our families, and it's awesome. We treat our, res our, our employees better, because if we treat our employees better, they treat our residents better. Um, very mindful of everything that we do there. Kurt Mai's commitment is to the community. You can see the quality. Um, this doesn't exist in, in the world of senior housing very often. There's a few, um, but we're proud to bring it to you. We're here to answer any questions that you have, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any other public comments? Mayor Dixon and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier. <clears throat> Uh, I, I want to speak to you about the general plan amendment portion of what you're being asked to approve. Uh, I may be one of the few people in Newport Beach who question staff's assertion that we have enough land dedicated to cultural uses that we can afford to give up even this much of it. But I wish to address a broader general plan issue. Our city is supposed to be on the verge of a general plan update to be based on the needs and wishes of our residents. We went through that before in 2003-2006, and we asked the residents what they wanted to see here in Newport Center in the year 2025, coming up pretty quick. They said Newport Center already had enough office space but they would like to see a limited number of new hotel rooms and up to 450 new dwelling units. What do we have now, 13 years later, here in Newport Center without this project? We have a reduction in hotel entitlements. We have two massive new office towers. We have this new civic center. We have a much enlarged golf clubhouse. We have an approved plan for a World Destination Tennis Tournament Center, and we have not 450, but without this, 524 new dwelling units at the corner of Jamboree and San Joaquin Hills Road. Almost all of this has been accomplished pretending it was not a change to the general plan. Not because it wasn't a change, but because in Newport Beach, amending the general plan may trigger the need for a public vote. To its credit, staff is acknowledging that this change from private institution to mixed use is a change in the general plan. But there's a great irony to this, because if you recall when you last approved the construction of assisted living for the Harbor Point facility in Santa Ana Heights, you were then told that land had to be changed from commercial to private institution. But approving this project as a massively enlarged private institution on this lot would have been way over the size limit requiring a public vote. So we're calling this residential, which it is, but you're not being asked to amend the general plan to reflect the true number of housing units that with this will have been added to Newport Center since the voters approved 450 units. You're being asked, if you look carefully at the staff report, to change the approved number of houses from 450 to 540 when the correct number is 619. If you go along with that, you're being complicit in a lie. That is not the correct number. I don't know why everyone is so afraid of a public vote, but you should be honest and correct the general plan with the correct number that this council and past councils have approved and let it go to a vote. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, can we just correct 
that assertion that there's a lie going on here, please? Who wants to address that? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. There, there is, there's no lie. Um, you know, this project is being presented to the City Council as residential units. It has services to uh, meet the assisted living needs. In the, in the past, for um, the, um, God, what's the, the villas, the villas for what? Villas Fashion Island. The Villas Fashion Island. There, were, there was a conversion of units from hotel to residential. The, that, at that time, that City Council adopted and passed the ordinance to allow that to occur. Um, there was no violation of the general plan at any time. And again, now uh, this project coming in, in front of you, there are 100 units in that uh, statistical area that if, they, if you exceed that 100 units, you, you trigger the vote. This project is not exceeding 100 units, it's only 90 units. Again, this project is a residential project. There are 90 units available in the statistical area. It doesn't trigger a, a, a Charter 423 vote. So I, we, we feel very comfortable this project is in compliance and, with our And the comment about Harbor Point? You know, Har Harbor Point was a different project. It's not residential units. It is strictly beds. It is semi-institutional. It's almost a semi-hospital. Um, they didn't need to have residential units. They want to treat that project is differently. Um, they had the square footage. They didn't need to consider it as, as a residential project. Hence, they it got converted to a PI designation. This is, you know, a similar business model, but from a zoning standpoint, a general plan standpoint, it was approached differently. It is residential units. That's how this project can get approved at this in this general area. Well, thank you. Any other public comments? Please come forward. Good evening. My name is Ruth Sanchez Kobayashi, and I live in Harbor Cove, directly across the street, across Jamboree, from this project. And um, I think this would be a great addition to our community, and um, I think you could definitely expect support from our neighborhood, um, particularly if a couple of things are addressed. Uh, one is, uh, which I accidentally spoke out of term before, um, is just for the safety of our commuters leaving for work in the morning, and particularly our high school students that are all new drivers, which you know what that's like. Um, and with our experience from the big, huge, ginormous apartments on the corner, um, we just had a ton, I remember talking to you about that at that time, we had a ton of huge trucks, including earth movers, that ran the red light at San Joaquin and Jamboree every single morning when we were all trying to drive kids to CDM. So I just ask that the people who know better than uh, a layperson would to see if that can be addressed and mitigated during construction. And um, although many people were not in favor of the museum house, I had changed my mind on that. And some people had uh, concerns about height, but everyone agreed that the architectural details of what we would be looking at uh, would be lovely. And um, the renderings of this still look fairly institutional, and it would be lovely every day when we drive out of our gate to look at something really beautiful. So I would just encourage um, those that are doing work on a beautiful inside would also ensure that what the neighbors see on the outside would also be lovely. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Public comment? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Um, let me comment. Um, I had the pleasure of visiting the facility yesterday and couldn't be more pleased with what I saw in Costa Mesa. And I think I learned that the majority of your residents are Newport Beach residents living in Costa Mesa. I would be very proud to see this facility for our seniors in Newport Beach. I uh, asked Simone to tell me, and I'm very proud of this next fact, that if this project is approved, we will have in the last 18 months approved 350, over 350 units for senior housing in our city. I mean, that is tremendous that this council has worked hard to do that over the last 18 months to provide really much needed housing in our community for our seniors and assisted living. But in the quality that this facility will be providing to our residents, I, I don't know if many of you have visited over there, but I encourage you to, I encourage you to put in your reservation now <laughs> because it is, Absolutely, it's the four, in my personal opinion, it's the four seasons of senior living. I mean, I didn't, I saw in a period of an hour's visit, saw several, several, many dozens of people, every single one with a smile on their face. I don't think you pre-program them. <laughs> 
and from the heated swimming pool to the outdoor pool to the pool room to the man cave to the theater to the dining area to the open kitchen to the quality food if my parents were alive i'd want them right there uh it it's it's really a, a, a facility that we we know many people will enjoy their last days of their lives in that facility. So I am a, a, an enthusiastic supporter, and I appreciate uh, the, Mr. Olson and, and Mr. Alder, your work uh, with us to accomplish this and put together a great package for our community, and I'm, I'm grateful. And so I will make a motion to support this project. In the spirit of exercising our ability to respond to the needs of our community, I will be happy to second this motion. And Mr. Duffield, you have a comment. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I do uh, want to say that um, <clears throat> the uh, the team that's doing this are so committed, and and it really is true. And um, you know. His first project, he asked me to invest, and I chickened out. Now I'm very upset I did that. <laughs> but um, this is sorely needed, and um, just the devotion and the the uh, sense of uh, quality, it, it, it just is an amazing uh, a thing that, that Kurt and uh, they, they've, they've come up with. It's, a, it's not anywhere else in the whole country, and it's right here. And so we're very lucky. And so good job, you guys. All right, let's go for a vote. Is that marijuana? I've never smelled it before. Prior to reading the vote, I'm going to read actually even the resolution titles for the two, first two items because they were incorrectly um, on the agenda. So resolution number 2019-74, a resolution of the City Council of City of Newport Beach certifying environmental impact report addendum number ER 2016-002 and approving a mitigation monitoring reporting program and adopting California Environmental Quality Act findings of fact and a statement of overriding considerations in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act for the Vonti Senior Housing Project located at 815 856 San Clemente Drive, resolution 2019-75, Resolution of the City Council of City of Newport Beach approving general plan amendment GP 2018-3 to change the land use designation for, from private and in, institutional to mixed use to horizontal for the Vivanti Senior Project located at 850 and 856 San Clemente Drive. Ordinance number 2019-13, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach adopting plan community development plan number PC 2018-001, amending the San, Juan, uh, San Joaquin Plaza plan community located at 850 and 856 San Clemente Drive. And lastly, ordinance number 2019-14, an ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach approving development agreement number DA 2018-005 for the Vivanti Senior Housing Project located at 850 and 856 San Clemente Drive. The motion care, oh, council member Herdman. <laughs> <laughs> the motion carries unanimously 7-0, yes, thank you. Very good. All right, current business, uh, approval of service agreement for citywide street light maintenance and repair services and Bear Electric, Electrical Inc. Do we need a staff report on this? Don't think so. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> All right. Uh, but uh, do I have any recuse an issue on this one, Mr. Harp? Oh, this is one where to play it safe, I'm recusing myself because sometimes they can add fiber, which can be used for um, telecommunication. So I'll recuse myself. Excuse okay. me. Thank you. All right. Uh, seeing no comments, I'll go out to public comments. Please come forward. Uh, Mayor Dixon, members of the council, my name is Jim Mosier, and I do have a comment on this. First, first I'd like to uh, thank the staff for putting this and the series of items here on the regular agenda for at least announcement and discussion potentially <clears throat> because they are big ticket items and they it's good to give them some prominence not hide them on the consent calendar second comment i wanted to make is i um, am pleased to see on the second page of the staff report that the council is being shown not just the technical scores but also the cost of each proposer <clears throat> And if you look at it closely, you'll see this, the company with the highest technical score charged quite a lot more. So you're being recommended to choose somebody with a marginally smaller technical score. 
but a better price. This is important to me because attending the steering committee meetings for the general plan update, I was surprised that committee was told they were not allowed to know what the prices were except for the highest scored proposer, which seemed to me like a very strange system. So I'm pleased that we're seeing that. And then I have another, perhaps this is an obscure comment, but it is about street lighting. <clears throat> and it recently came to my attention that the people on Balboa Island pay a special assessment for street lighting. Back in the 1960s, the residents there requested and the council agreed to form an assessment district called the Balboa Island Street Lighting District Assessment District 50. It started in about 1965. It was supposed to last for 20 years and in 1985, and it paid for some supplementary street lights. That assessment, now 30 years after it was supposed to end, I don't know if the people there know that they're paying this because it's hidden in the 1% property tax that they see on their bill, and they probably have no idea it's in there. I am wondering why we're still charging this 30 years after we said it was going to end. And second, whether those street lights are part of this contract or not. I know the city is aware of this because they actually segregate that money out into a special fund for street lights. So I'm wondering how that's related to this or if it is related to this. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Vukovic, do you have a comment to respond? Um, I got a heads up from Jim about this, and, but I haven't had time to investigate it. But my understanding is, is that that assessment district is long expired and there is no supplemental fee or district, but we'll, we'll take another look at it. Okay, any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back here. Any comments up here, Mr. O'Neill? I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and Ms. was that Mr. Herbin? No, it's Brian. Oh, Mr. Avery. Council Member Avery. All right, let's vote. With Council Member Muldoon recusing himself, the motion carries 6 0. All right, item number 18 the approval of a service agreement for citywide storm drain system cleaning services and downstream services, Inc. Do we need a staff report on this? Seeing none. All right, any, let's put it out to the public. Any comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back. Move approval. Second. All right, that was, who was Mr. Hurt? Brad oh, Brad down there, I can't hear you well. And Mr. Muldoon, okay, let's vote. The motion right. carries unanimously, 7-0. All right, item number 19, Park and Beach re Public Restrooms, Janitorial Services. Uh, I would like to hear a staff report on this. So. All right. I'll note a uh, recusal on this. My uh, law firm represented the old janitorial service, so as out of an abundance of caution, I will recuse myself. Okay. Uh, Mr. Webb? Yes, thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, we do have a staff report. I recall that this is a topic we had at your goal setting back in February, and we followed up with you on that. We've done some uh, improvements to our janitorial um, st services, our restrooms and parks. So tonight we have um, uh, Kyle Bordowski is our equipment and fleet manager, and also Micah Martin, our de deputy director, next to me to give the report. Good evening, Madam, Ma Madam Mayor and Council. So um, before you tonight in the staff report, um, we want to ask for two alternatives here on our janitorial services contract. So since February, we've increased our level of service to some degree to kind of ramp up our efforts to improve the level of service in our park and beach restroom facilities. Um, having done that, we, we've been able to further identify what our needs truly are. So through an RFP process, we've obtained proposals to um, increase that level of service even further to get us to the level of standards and expectations that all of us have. So what we'll be presenting to you tonight is, is what those options look like and um, what our recommendations are to you. So first, just, um, you know, why are park and beach restrooms so important um, and the cleanliness of those? Well, they're, they're really our frontline facilities. When everybody comes to visit the city of Newport Beach, they're most likely gonna visit one of our restroom facilities. And it's important to us that they have a good experience when they do that. 
Um, these facilities are used by our residents and our visitors, and they help define the experience in Newport Beach. Um, when you go places, um, you remember the times you've used the restroom that was in poor condition. That sticks with you. Um, so our, our community and visitor expectations are high for public and beach restrooms, so that's why we're taking this seriously. So just an example here, this is kind of some of our um, different park and beach restroom facilities and, and the demand that we have. Um, this is Balboa Island Fire Station and Ferry Restroom. You can see in the pictures there, there's lines outside the bathrooms, people waiting to use the restroom facilities there. Um, it's, it's a lot of use. Uh, we've we received a lot of complaints from there before. Um, it's a high demand facility. And then here, this is down at Corona Del Mar Main Beach. You can see all those cars, all those people on the beach. They're, they're all using the restroom, frequenting that restroom. You can see in the picture there on the right corner, there's a, a long line of people waiting to get in and use that restroom. So you can see the demand that's, that's placed on that. Uh, this is the Corona Del Mar Beach, Bolt Gully. Um, again, a lot, of, a lot of crowds there, a lot of, a lot of uses on a regular basis. 19th Street restrooms. Marina Park Lighthouse restroom building, a lot of use there. So to cut to the chase here, um, these, these are the current challenges we're facing with, with what we currently have. Um, th there's a logistical issue. It takes multiple crews to service all 30 restrooms daily. So you have these crews spread all over the city covering 30 restrooms. It is a challenge, especially if you have an you know, emergency that you need to attend to or, or a restroom that needs attention outside of its normal cleaning schedule. Um, there's th the high volume restrooms typically require continuous daily cleaning. So that's what we call a high use restroom, particularly down in the beach areas. Because of the use, it's just important that we're there cleaning it all day instead of just once or twice a day. Um, the issues with disrespectful users, transient population and vandalism. Um, people don't always respect the bathrooms to the level we would, we would hope they would. So um, that requires a lot of additional attention other than just cleaning. Um, and then these restrooms are prone to misuse. They require extra unscheduled cleanings, as I mentioned before. Um, the paper products are often depleted, either through a lot of use or people like to take things to go. And they take uh, paper towels or toilet paper with them and um, runs out quickly. So that requires a lot of attention. Uh, crowds and events also you know, require more frequent cleanings. If we're having a big event down on the beach and there's a lot of people in attendance, we have to put a lot more focus into that restroom and then that thins our staff in other areas. So the other restrooms don't receive as much attention. So it's always a balancing act there. And then um, as you know, you know, restroom janitorial staff, you know, cleaning restrooms isn't the most glamorous job. So it's, it's hard to keep people staffed in that. And there are just through attrition, there's a lot of turnover. And as a result, it affects the knowledge and familiarity of the facilities and the city overall. So a lot of training of new people and getting them familiar with the needs. So, you know, the city receives ongoing complaints regarding the cleanliness of these restrooms. I'm sure many of you receive complaints directly to you um, regarding some of these, some of these restroom needs. Um, so as, as Dave mentioned before in our city, City Council planning session in February, we were directed to, to look at increasing these levels of service. Could I just add, um, what, how do we, the hours of operations of our public restrooms? So Kyle could probably speak to this more detail than yeah, I can. Good evening. Uh, Dave introduced me as the, as the uh, fleet manager. I'm also the facilities manager too, because I have a, a real intimate knowledge of these restrooms. All of our restrooms are open 24 hours except for three. So there's Cliff, um, excuse me, Channel Place Park that's locked at night. There's Sunset Ridge that's, that's locked at night. And there's the Marina Park, uh, the lighthouse bathroom that's locked at night. The rest of them are open all night long. So I thought the 19th Street was closed at 10 or 11. 18th or 19th Street. I, I'd have to double check on that. I'm not sure because the challenge with locking them, there's, there's a few um, locals, I'll say, that will use that. And if it's locked, they'll you know what I mean? They'll, you'll, you'll have a mess at the door. So hmm. that's the challenge with those. The, w the, the lighthouse one was locked up because there's people can get in there. The, like the Channel Park place, we've locked that. It's, we had some people that were sleeping and living in that restroom. So those are the reasons we locked those up. And 19th Street heavily serves the harbor because of the pier there. So we get a lot of people at night coming off the boats and using that restroom. I thought the family there complained a lot. Uh, they, we do get complaints, but we need to have that restroom open. Uh, it was locked at one time. We had other problems with it because it was locked. So I've also heard the Sunset Ridge restroom has people living in it. Uh, that's locked at night, so there shouldn't be people living in it. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so to move forward with the presentation here. Oh, um, Brad, did you have a question? Oh. Excuse me, Mr. Avery. Um, <laughs> no, I think we, we all get it, and uh, I just want to thank you for the effort because this is the bottom of the pyramid for us. This is where it starts to get up to the apex of a great city. This is like, we can't do this. So it's really, it's really important stuff. And um, I just, I'm appreciative of the effort that went into answering the council's call to increase service. And then the, the numbers, when you just start the numbers at the very bottom, the number of residents and restrooms and the, and the time and it, and you get to a contract that's 2.4 million. And I think a lot of residents would question that. And I think that's why we're going through this is that's just right. to mm -hmm. sort of explain the, really the enormity of the task in this town on a, during the summer for sure and year round. So, you know, I really, for one, really appreciate the effort and um, yeah, it makes me proud to be a member of a city that we're taking care of that bottom part of it that's so important to the experience of everyone. It starts there and I agree, you, you remember it and you just go, that was an awful deal. And well, we hear about it. There's so much <laughs> pressure on the restrooms. Yeah, so this is great. And um, um, it, it costs what it costs to do that right. And it's, it's kind of sobering, but it's what it takes. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, so I'll just jump ahead here and just, just putting, putting before you, you know, what our options right. are. So currently, you know, prior to February, before our um, planning session, when we agreed to increase this level of service, we were at the $467,000 level. You know, that had seven high-use restrooms. Um, our, our, our peak season was Labor Day to Memorial Day, or Memorial Day to Labor Day, sorry. And we had two two-person crews trying to manage that. And obviously, we weren't accomplishing what we needed to do. So since then, we've increased that level of service to some degree. Um, we're working with maybe 10 high-use restrooms right now. It's kind of been fluctuating. Um, those are being cleaned, uh, still the same. The, the, the peak season is still the same. But, but what we've been finding is the season tends to start earlier and extend a lot longer than just Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we, we're seeing a lot more high use, frequent use, prolonging throughout the remainder of the year and throughout the year. So we're feeling that the Memorial Day, Labor Day season really isn't enough, um, but that's where we're at right now. We have, we've added an additional crew and that's brought our cost up to some degree. So that 592, that's a forecasted cost. If we were to continue this level at this rate now, that's what it would be costing us every year. But actually what we're proposing is in the third column there, um, we're proposing that we take it to 16 beach restrooms as high use facilities and that they would all be cleaned twice a day. And we would actually increase the detailed level of cleaning. So not just a quick cleaning of the restroom, but actually a really thorough cleaning of that restroom facility, get it really clean. Um, we're, we're proposing to extend that season from March to October. That would really cover all the summer months, all the prolonged use of, of all the beach restrooms. And then we'd be adding an additional crew to help cover all those. And that would be during that extended peak season. And, and didn't I read that you start earlier at 7 a.m.? Yeah, so as part of that, all the bathrooms would be clean and ready for use by 7 a.m. Could, uh, oh, uh, Mr. Avery. Would, would you mind just going over so the, the way we double check, in other words, you get a new contractor and they start out, they're great, and it's just to stay on them to keep that level of service up. So we've got our own staff that are checking that, right? Yeah, the, the contractor that's working it now has is, is worked out really well for us. We have a great rapport, and they're um, very knowledgeable of the trouble spots and the things it takes. We meet with them uh, almost daily, texting, contacting. They're, they're our first eyes if we have graffiti or if we have any type of dan damage vandalism. So, And then we also we do a phone conference weekly uh, to check up and do a lot of spot checks. We have a a great relationship with the on-site supervisors to kind of see, right. you know, what they're, if they have any attendance issues, we ask for daily attendance reports if they, you know, because if, if they're missing one worker that, that just yeah. throws the whole, right, one person right. cannot clean those bathrooms in, yep. in a time, in enough time to get around and hit all 30 before 7 a.m. So it's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts to it. It's, it, it takes a lot, but we, uh, Rick and I, Rick Scott and I, we, we work closely with them to stay on top of it and make sure it, it's, uh, we, we actually had a lady approach us today on the pier and told us she was really happy. She's out of town and, and saw the pier bathroom at, right. at McFadden and was thrilled that it was so clean. So Yeah, huh. great. And then to, to, 
does this vendor take care of the uh, the graffiti or do we bring out our graffiti team? We have a graffiti team that responds. Mm -hmm. we, we have some spray cans and some stuff to take off the light, uh, yeah. the, the light stuff, but there's, mm -hmm. it can get pretty abusive. And we also have a crew that responds right. to that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think to conclude this report, staff's recommending the first option, uh, the higher level of cleaning, and that's uh, recommendation A, B, and C for you tonight, uh, recognizing that is an increase in general funds. Um, we worked the city manager a little bit, and we did find some savings within the department budget, so we're transferring 140 there, and then we'll be asking for an additional general fund to provide this higher level of uh, uh, service. And looking for your uh, direction on this tonight. Okay. Any comments up here, or we'll go out to the public? Any public comments? Seeing none, let's bring it back here. Do we have a motion? I'll move, um, move staff uh, recommendation. Do we have a second? Mr. Duffield, uh, let's vote. We have a motion by Mr. Herdman and seconded by Mr. Duffield. Let's vote. With Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill recusing himself, the motion carries 6-0. All right, the last item, uh, number 20, appointment of a new city arts commissioner to fill an unscheduled vacancy. And this term would end June 30th, 2021, to replace um, Barbara Gladman's term. And it'd be appropriate to have public comments prior to reading the votes. Okay, any comments by the council? Any public comments? Please come forward. I see none, we'll bring it back up here. Any comments or questions? And I know you gave us ballots and I'm looking for them right now. What did I do with my ballot? Just real quick. Maybe under your. I think it's. I think it's coming. It's here. Madam Mayor, uh, while we're uh, waiting for the votes tabulation, um, we wanted to do a quick introduction for a new Deputy uh, Public Works Director. Very That's good. Added, um, Jim Houlihan. Yes, um, Mr. Houlihan. Nice. Uh, Mr. Webb, do you want to? Jim's our new City Engineer, Deputy Director of Public Works. Really happy to have Jim. Came over from the City of Irvine with us. Sorry for the long delay to get about a year to get here, but we're, we're excited to have Jim. Jim will be taking over the Capital Improvement Program mainly, so, and I ask him to work directly with all you folks. So feel free to call Jim or meet with us in office hours uh, along with myself. So thanks, Jim. Congratula congratulations for joining us. Thank you. And welcome. We're happy to have you here. Glad you didn't have to go too far. <laughs> all right. Okay, I'll now read the votes for the um, City Arts Commission position. There's one seat. Council Member Herdman votes for Crystal Anderson. Council Member Brenner, Carrie Williams. Council Member Muldoon, Maureen Flanagan. Council Member Avery, Maureen Flanagan. Oh, and um, in order to be no um, appointed, the nominee must receive at least four votes. Council Member Duffield, Maureen Flanagan, Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill, Maureen Flanagan, Mayor Dixon, Maureen Flanagan, with Maureen Flanagan receiving five votes. Um, she is the new Great. City Arts Commissioner for a term ending June 30th, 2021. Very good, all right, Madam Clerk. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the city council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the council members who voted with the prevailing side. Any motion for reconsideration? I see none. All right. And Mayor Pro Tem O'Neill has an adjournment announcement. Thank you. Until last week, Eric Woolery was the Orange County Auditor Controller. He was elected in June 2014 and re-elected to the post in June 2018. He graduated Cal State Fullerton with a degree in business. He later served as the treasurer of Orange, an elected member of the Orange County Board of Education and deputy director of administration for the Riverside County District Attorney's Office. His wife Lisa has said recently that Eric was the very best man, brave, tenacious, a writer of wrongs. He is survived by Lisa and their two young children, Liam and Kate. Funeral services will be held tomorrow at 11 a.m. at Calvary Church in Santa Ana. Thank you. Wow, well, thank you. We are adjourned, thank you.